Okay, this is the public access writing contest uh, workshop for contest participants and anyone else who's interested in writing public access mysteries and odyssey tapes. Um, I'm going to start by introducing myself. My name is Jason Cordova. I am the creator and publisher of public access as well as the two games from which it's derived Brindlewood Bay and the between. And I'm very excited to run this workshop. This is one of four or five that I've run uh, with uh, advice on how to like write scenarios for our games. And so you should definitely check out my YouTube channel for other workshops uh, that relate to that stuff if it's something that's interested or interesting to you. So the way this is gonna go is, um, first of all, just a few rules for the, uh, for the workshop here. Uh, please stay on mute if you're not talking. Um, the first time you speak, um, introduce yourself with your pronouns. Um, if you have a question and you just want to like kind of get in the question queue, uh, just raise your hand or I think there's even like a little hand raise emoji thing you can put on your Zoom screen uh, that helps me a lot. Or just say in the chat that you have a question or put your question in the chat. I won't be paying super close attention to the chat when I'm doing my little portions of each hour, but I will do my best to look at it while uh, we're having open discussion. This is going to be divided up into three uh, hours. The first hour or the first 15 to 20 minutes of each hour is going to be me just going over some notes and kind of sharing my thoughts and remarks on whatever we're talking about for that hour. And then the remainder of the hour will be open discussion. If you have questions about something specific to your mystery, you should absolutely save it for that time period. Um, if you have uh, like thoughts on different on people's questions, please chime in. I've noticed that on the call, we have a number of uh, published scenario writers and contest winners and um, uh, and translators of games. So everybody here is you know, seems to be pretty well um, in the mix as far as writing Car from Brindlewood stuff goes, or most everyone anyway. And so everyone's input is valued in that regard. So I think I just want to dive right in to the first hour here, which is basically going to be sort of like big picture stuff. Now, the majority of this workshop is going to be for mystery writing that is of course just one of the tracks in the contest the other track which is the odyssey tape track i will dedicate some time at the end of the workshop for that but there's not as much like stuff to go through there so it'll be pretty you know brief uh, part of the workshop mysteries are the big thing here and for this first hour i really want to talk about just sort of the big picture um the role that like theme and idea and concepts play in your mystery, um, presenting the mystery and questions and opportunities, which is probably the most important part of writing your mystery. And so we're going to dive right into that. So I think in terms of the big picture of writing any car from Bridwood mystery, but especially for public access, you really have to kind of keep in mind the function of the mysteries in terms of the gameplay, like the role they serve in the gameplay. This is really important to keep in mind as you're writing it because you always want to be sort of serving that gameplay role, right? Or that gameplay goal and gameplay purpose. Um, you know, mysteries, importantly, they sort of give the players everything they need to begin the investigation, right? In public access, we want to see the latchkeys um, investigating mysteries. We want to get them started. And so a big thing that your mystery does is present enough information so that they can do that. It provides a skeletal framework for the keeper. The mystery structure is not an A to Z, like sort of whodunit, right? It is, it highlights major elements that make an appearance in the mystery and how those elements sort of uh, react to the Latchkey's investigation. I like to consider it a sort of like toy box approach to scenario writing. So you are not like giving the keeper necessarily you know, all this information of like, okay, here's this place and this place, and this happens at this time, and this is this, it's not like that. It's, here's an interesting collection of characters, here's an interesting collection of locations and monsters and, and supernatural entities, and the keeper should be able to easily pick from them in the moment in order to uh, challenge the players or the latchkeys with, with something, right? And so that's sort of the, um, that's, that's the main function of the mysteries, right? And it's what makes Car from Brindlewood mysteries different from, say, more traditional role playing game scenarios. I think it's a big distinction how they're kind of used. One thing I think is really important when you are setting out to write your mystery, if you haven't done so yet, if you're still sort of in the planning phases, um, is to keep a few things in mind that make public access uh, a little different from other game settings. 
So this game has a really specific time period uh, that is not a thing a lot of games do. This game takes place over the course of a few months in the summer of 2004. That is, um, I don't think you should like necessarily limit yourself in terms of what you write about because of that, but I do think it's something to keep in mind and it's worth looking into a little bit. Like what would have been things that people in their early 20s in 2004 would have been concerned with that can help inform what you might write about right so as a person in their early 20s in 2004 i was very concerned about for example the uh the iraq war um the fallout from 9 11 um the way that our government and society was changing because of 9 11. Uh, as a gay man i was specifically interested in the fact that 2004 was when uh, the Republicans were going ape shit on gay marriage, right? And like trying to ban it and everything. And so these are these are just some of the things that were like affecting me, right? Um, it's also worth thinking about how these characters might have been thinking about their own childhood and kind of where they came from. The game takes place in 2004, but truly it's a game about the late 80s and early 90s, right? It's about this like really nostalgic sort of idea. Um, it's this idea that you know, ultimately public access is this game about where all the sorts of things we were kind of scared of in the 80s and 90s, like what if they were true? Like what if they actually happened, right? That's sort of a good way of thinking about big ideas in this game. Uh, the setting is important to keep in mind. Um, it is in this fictional setting called Degoya County, New Mexico. It is a remote corner of New Mexico. It's in the desert. It's very weird, it's rural. I think the best comparison here is probably Welcome to Night Vale. Um, if Welcome to Night Vale was not as like comedic and much more on the like kind of scary, creepy, weird cosmic horror side, that's basically what Degoya County is. That can be another source of inspiration as far as thinking about what your mystery is about. Also think about like the player characters and the scope of what the player characters might be interested in doing. So. For those of you who have read the rules, you know that these characters came to uh, Deep Lake, New Mexico, this town in Degoya County, in order to investigate the disappearance of this TV station, a literal disappearance of this TV station. And they're not making a lot of headway on that, but they are having these other mysteries presented to them on the way. And so while they're there in town, they're looking into that. But I think it's kind of important to consider that the characters kind of came there for fun right like none of them came to deep lake to get involved in like dangerous stuff they came there to be young people who met on the internet and one of them had a wild idea to like come out to deep lake right they're also connected because they used to all live in the town when they were little kids and so they'll they're going to get as the game progresses they should get more um interested in the deeper more dangerous aspects of the setting but in the beginning they may not be and We've reflected this in the published uh, material in the mysteries that are official in by essentially saying, okay, you know, in the presentation of each of the mysteries, with the exception of one of them, we try to make it seem like, you know, this is just something that caught your attention. Like, this is just something you might be interested in. This is just something that, you know, you could kill time doing while you're doing this other thing or whatever, right? It's, it's meant to feel kind of like low stakes and low key, right? Because I don't think young people in their 20s in the year 2004 would immediately want to go investigate something where they thought they could be killed or be arrested or something, right? So just kind of think about that as well. Like what is realistic scope of like how the mystery might start? Now it might get really dangerous, right? And it might get really scary. And, um, but I think in order to, it, to be something that the latchkeys would be interested in looking into in the first place, I think it has to feel kind of low stakes in the beginning. Now, the difference of course, is the one mystery called Convergence, which, specifically can only be used at a certain point in the campaign and it has a slightly different setup it has a setup that assumes that the latchkeys have been through a lot already right and so they have a different expectation and it's okay for you to like present something that's a little more dark and a little more dangerous if you want to write a mystery that is much more obviously supernatural obviously dangerous um obviously more like complicated or law breaking or whatever uh, you can put a little note like Convergence has that says, this is something you do later in the campaign, right? So as long as you're kind of giving the keeper the information they need to make that choice for the campaign, I think you're in good shape. And that's a playability issue. Another thing to think about when you're thinking about big ideas for your mystery is, well, like the theme or the concept. Um, 
you should pick a concept, a central idea, maybe a theme around which to develop your mystery. That idea or theme acts as a touchstone for when you're actually writing the various sections. It's something you can always kind of fall back on if you need ideas or inspiration. It helps give the mystery an overall more coherent feel. And it can really enhance the cinematic quality of the gameplay as well, because um, something good writers do is that they they do think about like themes, they do think about like the big high concepts, the big idea, and how to sort of weave that in so that it creates a more coherent experience, right? And I think it creates a more cinematic gameplay experience as well. One thing that public access sort of gives us the opportunity to do that say the Between or Brindlewood Bay do not, is public access also opens up the possibility of organizing your mystery around something in pop culture or around horror subgenres, right? Um, you know, movies, music, uh, video games, anything that's sort of like tinted with nostalgia, these can all be great things to inspire your mystery, right? Several of the mysteries we published have pretty clear inspirations in pop culture. Um, one of the ones that I'm currently working on has is specifically inspired by the uh, terrible but amazing 80s horror movie, The Stuff, about killer ice cream, right? Like, you can, um, you know, using something like that as your direct inspiration is something else you can do as well. Um, also, horror subgenres are really key here, too. In the official mysteries, we kind of play with two big subgenres, uh, slashers, uh, and then we also play with sort of like cosmic horror and weirdness, um, even like kind of science fantasy-ish in a way. So there's another, um, you have some other, there's some other ways you can kind of, you know, get your big idea organized there. One thing that mysteries have is um, a key. This is a specific mechanical thing that if you are familiar with Carved from Brindlewood games, the analogs and the other games are like the Janus mask or the crowns of the queen and the crown of the void. Um, the key is something that you can have on your mystery and I'm including the notes here in this part of my talk because the key should be very connected to your big idea or your theme, right? Um, and so it, I recommend just looking at some of the mysteries and kind of seeing and reading some of the different keys that are available and then uh, sort of thinking about how that key sort of like connected in with the, with the sort of overall theme of the mystery. I also find it's useful to write your key last um, because something you can do if you write it last is you can then you can kind of look at the full sweep of what turned out to be important in the mystery in terms of like elements and themes and characters and ideas and then you can have that key which is the mechanical thing that the players interact with really directly you can then have that like really reflect what ultimately happened in your mystery right you can really connect it up in a strong way so that's just my my personal technique when i'm writing these is to do the key last because it sort of brings it all kind of home and it's a player facing thing. So I think that's important to do. So big picture out of the way, let's get to what is probably the most important part of writing your mystery. I think hands down, this is the most difficult part. It's the most important part and from a playability standpoint. And indeed, when I am editing uh, mysteries for our games to publish, it is the part I have to spend the most time um, either uh, adjusting or changing or making sure it works. Um, it is, it's a big like kind of playability thing. And that is, presenting your mystery, and then the connected uh, questions and opportunities. When you're presenting your mystery, this is text that is read aloud directly to the players. And by the time it's over, the players should know exactly what they need to do to get started on solving the mystery, right? They should be like locked and loaded and ready to go. And so your goals here, when you're writing the presentation part of your mystery is to, um, First of all, explain how the latchkeys learn about the mystery. That's important, like who brought it to them. Explain the basics of the mystery, including any necessary background information or local legends. That's particularly important in public access, right? Like what is the sort of local story here? Um, an optional thing you can do, not necessary, but something you can do is you can build in some what I call like activities, uh, especially if it helps reinforce the theme of the mystery. So if you look at Slumber Party Summoning Circle, that one has a whole, like a whole lot of the presentation is dedicated to exploring the slumber party, right? And doing little games and like and things in the slumber party. And 
it's all resolved just through the posing and answering of questions to the players. But by the time it's all done, it's like we just had like a little slumber party. We got to see all the little thing. We got to play the crying circle. We got to do all this stuff, right? If you look at the other games, like um, uh, like Brindlewood Bay, for example, Brindlewood Bay doesn't have the same scripted uh, presentation that public access does, but it does have the activity in the Great Brindlewood Bay Bake Off, right? Where the players have to like, you know, talk about the pies and cakes they made or whatever, right? So you can kind of build in some little fun stuff. You should especially do this if it helps reinforce the theme or the big idea in your mystery, right? So for Slumber Party Summoning Circle, the Slumber Party is sort of the big entree into the mystery, right? It was a big important part of it. So I wanted to really emphasize this Slumber Party activities in the presentation. You should create some hooks for the latchkeys if necessary. Um, you can do that in different ways by just stating things to be true, or you can say, uh, latchkey, latchkey X, you knew this person from back when, what was something that made you think, you know, X, Y, Z, it's just, you just sort of ask a question that sort of hooks them into the mystery so that they have a little extra reason to care. You should present a few leads so the latchkeys can begin their investigation, people, places, things to go look into, and then you should, at the end, one of your goals, your primary goal truly, is to focus the latchkeys on the questions you're about to present to them, okay? So this is, I'm gonna swing right into the questions and opportunities part because, well, actually, no. I wanna say that this is like, I said earlier that it's like the trickiest part of writing a mystery, and it is, because you have to get the presentation to flow logically into the questions and opportunities. From a playability standpoint, this part of your mystery has to be really airtight. You cannot have any logical inconsistencies between the presentation and the questions and opportunities, and you have to avoid the possibility of latchkeys pursuing some kind of question or theory that isn't a focus of the mystery. So for example, in Slumber Party Summoning Circle, there is no daylight between the idea of Linnea Rodenbecker uh, like got, you know, we did a summoning game and Linnea Rodenbecker got possessed by something like that absolutely happened, right? You, you cannot leave any room for the possibility of Linnea Rodenbecker is just faking it for some reason, you know, or, or something, you know, there's like some other explanation, like you, it, you have to sort of like really, really focus it in. In the between, this is really easy to do because in the between, these are characters who already do this as their job, like they do investigations, they do monstrous hunting, you know, and so they've already done a lot of like, like investigation before the game even starts, you know, so you can kind of just say what they discovered. The public access is a little trickier because these people might not have necessarily done that. And so you definitely have to kind of really f like you're really kind of like funneling down into this like, okay, here are the possibilities, here are the questions we're going to pursue. And there's, you know, the questions aren't the only questions they might pursue, but for, in terms of gameplay, they're the important questions and they're the things that we need the players focusing on, right? And so you just have to make sure there are no like big gaps and, um, and that truly like, you know, you got to just move into the questions. I think there's some different strategies for like accomplishing this that are helpful. Um, using questions to define certain things as true or to eliminate certain possibilities is a great way of doing it. So in the house in Escondido Street, you just ask one of the players straight up, why do you think this house is evil, <laughs> right? Like it, the house is evil, why is the house evil, right? And so we know the house is evil, that is what we're doing here, right? You can, it can be very leading like that, right? And very like thumb on the scale, that's desirable. You want that in these games. You can also just give the latchkeys lots of information to start with. Um, you know, in some ways, the latchkeys kind of arrive in the middle of the investigation, right? Um, with the Zagreus mystery, for example, that mystery starts with one latchkey in particular knowing a lot about Zagreus, about this arcade game. They know its history. They know its stories. They're on a forum. They're talking to people. They're being uh, stalked and harassed by one of the people on the forums. There's like... Um, there's a lot of like just preloaded information there. That's another way you can do this. Uh, but definitely just, you know, get them to the questions and opportunities and make sure there's no gaps and make sure it's a really focused, like we're focusing down in on that. It is the trickiest part, but once you get past it, it truly is like, I think the rest of the mystery writing is pretty straightforward. It's just creative writing at that point, but uh, for the most part. Um, the questions and opportunities from a content standpoint, as long as at least one of the question and opportunity pairs allows for the resolution of the mystery, you can do pretty much anything you want here. 
it really is your opportunity to explore different facets and aspects of the mystery, right? This is your chance as the writer to, you know, to really put your your mark on things and say, this is what I'm interested in exploring here. This is something I want to do, right? This is what I'm interested in, in doing. As long as one of your Q and O pairs leads to a resolution of the mystery, you can have other Q and O's to do other things, right? So in the house in Escondido Street, I was really interested in this idea that you might make contact with the little ghost boy. And so I created a question opportunity, actually a special rule, and then a question opportunity that allows you to sort of explore that. It has nothing to do with resolving the mystery. It's purely just like something I thought would be fun to do, right? Um, when uh, when Alex wrote Zagreus, he came up with this sort of like multi-tiered structure where uh, it's not even like resolving the mystery to be dealing with the the online stalker guy, right? Like that's just something you do. But he just wanted to do that because that, that was a cool thing to do, and it's just something the characters can interact with, and it's fun. There's another question, another thing that you sort of get to about the actual arcade game, and so. You can keep it kind of simple, just you know, a question that lets you resolve it, or you can add in new things. You can kind of stretch your sort of rules writing and creativity muscles by creating like different sorts of things that can be pursued. Um, you know, the most important thing, of course, as I've said already, is that the questions really have to connect logically to the presentation. I used to call this the big sync, S-Y-N-C, um, which basically just means that like, they have to match, right? Like the presentation and the questions have to match. They cannot be, there cannot be any like weirdness between them. They have to like, they have to flow. When you're doing your questions, over time, some basic types have developed as we've kind of been doing this publishing. Um, you know, the, the, the standard sort of like mystery resolution question is some version of what is causing this thing or where do we find this thing or how can we stop this thing? Pretty straightforward and it's a really dependable approach to the mystery. There's also question types that I call threshold question types, which is essentially it asks the latchkeys to learn a key element of the mystery before they can actually figure out how to resolve it. So in Slumber Party, the threshold question is, okay, we know Linnea got possessed. Is she possessed by a ghost or a demon, <laughs> right? And then once you figure that out, then you you get to the, how do we deal with the ghost or the demon problem, right? Um, you can have questions that unlock things, that unlock new gameplay elements. That's sort of like the ghost boy in Escondido Street. Uh, Zagreus has stuff like that. Um, questions that basically unlock new rules and new moves. This is trickier sort of like game design type writing, but you should give it a shot. I mean, there's, you know, look at what's out there. And, you know, if you have like a cool idea, you definitely go for it. Um, you'll get big creativity points from the judges. Um, you know, there's other possibilities as far as questions go. And I'd be curious to hear what other people have come up with, but those are some of the sort of basics in terms of question types. So that I think is the, extent of my remarks for the first hour. At this point, I'm going to turn it over to the group. If anyone has a specific question, you can ask it. If anybody has a comment about something I've said, you can say it. Um, and if you have uh, want to expand on something that I've said, please do that as well. So who would like to go first? Uh, go ahead, B. So how do you determine the complexity number? Is that something we need to do? Great question. Yeah. Um, terrific question. So the complexity cannot of, of the, the complexity to resolve the overall mystery cannot be more than eight total. So if you have a two part question, like a threshold question, and then a second part, they should be four each or two and six. They should be even numbers so that um, when you are um, when the players are making a decision about whether they want to answer the question or not, they have to be able they have to have half as many question have as many clues of the complexity in order to attempt it and so for ease i just i like for the complexities to be even i don't think that's like necessarily a hard and fast thing but i just think it's a good practice um but yeah eight total to resolve is pretty good um in terms of like just it's kind of like it seems like two is easy four is you know medium six is like really hard uh, if you have just like one question and one type of resolution maybe just go straight for eight on that just just to give it some legs you know to give it some space to breathe there's no real um like hard and fast rules here except um i do think that like a com like a total complexity to resolve more than eight is too much I, I just think it's like it gets a little unwieldy at that point great question though thank you thank you that's awesome any other thoughts or questions? 
Uh, quite a man does. Sorry about that. My uh, computer decided to disconnect my mouse. Um, this is actually kind of a follow up question on the complexity stuff. I remember reading something in, it might have been the between, about how a lower complexity question tends to have higher stakes and the um, inverse all the way down. <laughs> uh, is that still something that is a focus? Yeah, let me, ex let me kind of go and let me explain more what Amanda's talking about. So some question opportunity sets have like multiple ways of resolving the mystery. Um, this comes up a lot more in my other game, The Between. Um, I don't know if it's so much of a thing in public access, I can't recall, but, um, but basically it would be like three different questions, all of them different complexities and all of them different ways of resolving the mystery. And what we used to say as a rule of thumb, and I think it's a good rule of thumb, is the option with the lower complexity should have the more dangerous resolution, right? And then the option with the higher complexity should have the easier resolution. So I'll use my between example of Sally No Face, who is this like kind of serial killer character, this Jack the Ripper type character. And your options were, uh, where is Sally's lair? That was the easiest question, complexity four. And the resolution was you have to go into her lair to capture, to capture her, right? This was, this was considered the most dangerous resolution because you're on her territory, right? The complexity six one, which was the middle option was um, how do we lure her to us? So here it's still somewhat dangerous because you have to confront her physically and, uh, and maybe try to capture her, but at least you're doing it on your terms. And then the hardest complexity question had the easiest resolution or the least dangerous resolution, which is um, what's making her do this? And the resolution was you sort of empathize with Sally and get her to just turn herself in essentially, right? And so that um, that was sort of the balance that we always struck in the between. And I think it's a good move here too. Like if you have a if you have like multiple possibilities for resolution, play with that, right? Like go with, you know, if you have a have maybe have an easier one that's more dangerous, you know, maybe have a, you know, a hard one that asks a really complex question, but if you can answer it, it's 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 almost done, right? Um one thing to keep in mind, this is a tangential point, but I think it's important, is that in the gameplay, for those of you who haven't had a chance to play yet, in the gameplay, the gameplay is truly divided up into like two parts, right? The investigation is just one part of it. The resolution is the other part of it. There is gameplay that happens there, right? And so you can kind of keep that in mind as well as you're writing your mystery. The question might just be a thing that gets you to the cool resolution, right? Like the thing you, you know, the, the fun the fun activity right that's another way of kind of approaching it um did that help amanda yep thank you awesome great uh dimitri yeah thank you i'm sorry i can show my face because your workshop somehow caught me on the run but still uh can the complexity be player dependent because right now i am stuck in the between campaign for five players mm. i knew you didn't recommend to do that but still <laughs> and they're just farming the clues like you know like a farmer in ohio so what's what are yeah. your thoughts on that i mean i think that like in your individual home game, if the keeper wants to make that call, they can do that. Like if you have a lot of players and you want to bump up the complexity just to make it more of a challenge, you should absolutely do that. For purposes of writing the mystery though, I think you should stick to like the recommended advice just because, um, you know, just because like, you know, uh, ideally, you know, you are playing with the recommended number of players, right? Um, which I never recommend more than four players for any role playing game, but especially mine. Um, but that said, yeah, you can, I think bumping up the complexity is something you can definitely do. If there's some reason why your mystery is like particularly suitable for larger numbers of players, maybe you could talk about that in your text. But, uh, but otherwise, I would just, I would assume like the, the like, you know, the, the assumed number of players, basically. Okay, thank you for that help. So I'll just raise the complexity of my games. Like, hey, Jason, it allowed me to do that. Indeed, yeah, go for it. I think thank it's you. perfectly fine. You have my permission. <laughs> uh, I'm taking a look at chat as well, but are there any other questions or comments? Looks like maybe not. Maybe so. Joe, go ahead. I guess this is also attached to complexity. I know that in Brindlewood Bay, there was a suggested limit of 
suspects and so forth that was in it is yeah. something similar um, to be represented in public access? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think, you know, Brindwood Bay has been out in the world a lot longer and we've had a lot more time with it, but I think that there's a lot of applicable ideas and best practices there that you can take into public access. Um, I like, I like things in like basically fives and sevens, basically. I think that's like a good number of things. Um, seven locations, five to seven locations, five to seven characters is usually a good number to give the, the keeper enough to play with. Um, yeah, definitely. I, I think that for purposes of the contest, you know, I, it, as long as you're within word count, more can't hurt, <laughs> right? Like g g give, give, give the judges more to be in love with, right? Is always a good move. Um, if it was something we were publishing, we would probably scale it back, but that's a different question, a different concern, yeah. Uh, Jazzy? Um, yeah, so my question is, um, so sometimes, the questions that are asked to players at the start to uh, determine something or to hook them in. Um, sometimes they will be like, ask this to the um, the player with the highest um, vitality, presence, whatever. Um, and then sometimes it's just like um, a player of your choice. Are there any best practices for when to pick which one or any um, like the thought process behind picking which one you do? Yeah, uh, so th there is um, for me. Um, there, now this is this is just like how I do it, and you. I don't think there's anything that necessarily mandates this be it be this way. But um, I like to when I'm looking at like okay, it's like we're publishing like you know say eight mysteries for this game. I like for there to be some times when the mysteries like make certain characters or certain players choices highlighted right so if i chose to make my character a little bit smarter um i sometimes want that to come out in the game right with like here's here's something that you have to contend with because you chose to make your character smarter right um or here's something you have to contend with because you chose to mark this key so early in the game right like that kind of thing um it's it is one way of sort of it's it's a way of kind of focusing the players, right? And folk and kind of focusing them on on what's really at stake. Um, saving questions for characters with high sensitivity uh, subtly enforces the supernatural aspects of what's going on, right? It kind of sends a message to the play group of like, hey, there are there are supernatural things happening here, and we know this because our most supernaturally inclined character has to answer a question about it, right? Um, but but really you can't go wrong by just thinking like, hmm, is there any particular character because of their choices would be best to answer this? And if not, then just going with the character of your choice. But it's probably more of a like kind of, um, it's honestly probably more of like a, I'm publishing a whole bunch of mysteries and I wanna have a good mix of options and possibilities sort of thing. I don't know how important it is for this contest, except to just show that you've thought a lot about like how it might go in gameplay. Let's see. Other questions or comments? Uh, go ahead, Al. Hey, uh, just to add to what you were just, uh, the question you were just addressing, Jason, I know that when I'm writing mysteries or scenarios for these games, um, if the establishing question is something that helps establish a particular relationship with a side character or a like, a chunk or event in a character's history, um, I'm more inclined to make it a, you know, direct to a hunter or latchkey of your choice sort of thing, because it gives the keeper the freedom to decide who's the most interesting person to, to choose to engage with us. I so think it's a great point. Yeah, that's a terrific point, because um, I think you can never go wrong with like keeper flexibility, right? I think that's, that's, that's a really important thing, because, you know, you're like five or six sessions into a campaign, and if if all the little, if all your establishing questions have been like focused on one character, it's going to make some players feel a little like left out, right? So, a keeper, a player of your choices, or a character of your choice is always a good, a good kind of flexibility option as well. Yeah, that's a good point. Anybody else? Uh, Nicholas, go ahead. You have to unmute on the. There you go. Yes. Hello. 
Um, rega regarding the introduction question, um, is it a good practice to address it in the mystery reward uh, to a particular latch key based on the, the nostalgia? the nostalgic uh, activities of something like you could that. yeah you definitely could i mean that's one way of that's one way of sort of showing for the contest purposes it's a great way of showing the judges that you've thought a lot about how this is going to go you know if you say like you could you could frame it like pose the pose this question to the character who's you know who has something connected to video games in their you know the things that take them back or the latch give your choice always put or the latch give your choice in case there's nobody who has such a thing <laughs> right yeah um but no that's a great way of doing it as well or conditions like if there's a condition that you want to like highlight could be a problem maybe you could say something like you know pose the following to the latch key with the most emotional conditions currently listed on their sheet or something like that right just as a way of it's just another way of showing like you know that of kind of adding just like a personal touch and like that you've given a lot of thought to like how you think this is going to like affect the group and how it's going to affect the play. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. My idea behind that was uh, to focus on the theme of the mystery to add uh, that uh, on the first part. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Other questions. Looking, looking, looking. Are we good? Joe, go ahead. Uh, when it comes to the latch keys of the sandstone arch, there's one <laughs> yeah. in particular that removes a latch key kind more or less from play when it happens. Yeah. And yeah. I was wondering if you've had any uh, experience with dealing with that because it also it kind of feels like other games where it's like, oh, your character's unconscious and then the player's just sort of there yeah. experiencing everything, but having very minimal input. I so I uh, I think um it's probably a little bit beyond the scope of like of like for mystery writing, but I do think that it's worth talking about because this is an aspect. So what Joe's referring to is a one of the keys of desolation is called um, the chromatic desert and the chromatic desert uh, who, uh, uh, in fact, the game I'm running right now, uh, the player who has the chromatic desert mark Steph is on the call. So maybe Steph can chime in, but um, I love it personally. Uh, I, I love the, um, I love role-playing challenges like this. And I think that anytime you can, if you can write something into your mystery that introduces a really weird role-playing challenge that is especially salient with your idea or the game's themes, um, I think it's a, I think the judges would love that personally. Um, now, you know, is it something that like would pass muster at the game table? Who knows? But, you know, it's something you'd have to play test to figure out. But for the contest purposes, um, the Chromatic Desert is a big swing, right? In terms of like gameplay. And I I personally love it. And I think if you wanna take big swings like that in your mystery, you should do it, so. Um, but Steph, maybe you wanna chime in about your experience playing a character who has been in the chromatic desert for a while now. Yeah, I would love to. Uh, so personally, I when, when I first uh, made the character that I'm playing in this uh, run through of public access, I took I Am Error right out of the gate because i knew that i wanted to experience what that meant in the game like from the get-go uh so i find that if you really focus on what it is that you want out of that experience like for me i really wanted to explore what it would be like to be effectively a ghost in the world and still trying to interact with things and figure things out but not also being necessarily a full ghost at the same time because you can still sort of interact with people and things uh, at least if you have i am error marked um, and even if you don't still being able to interact with the world and shape the environment in such a direct way gives you a lot of control over the fiction in ways that you don't have when you are uh, playing like a physical character for lack of a better word um so for uh to use an example uh 
and this is uh, potentially small spoilers for signals from the other side, um, in that I uh, took the opportunity to add some world building that I thought would be really neat to the whole story. Uh, I described that there are like these otherworldly cameras that are basically everywhere, always showing everything on any TV that can be basically connected to it. Um, and that is something that I wouldn't have been able to realistically do super well if I wasn't in the chromatic desert. Uh, so really, it, it just depends on what you're after when you mark it. And uh, it just takes a little bit of thinking beforehand, uh, especially if you want to get like a nice cinematic version of it. Um, it does take a little bit of floor planning so that then you can really like hit it out of the park. But it's so rewarding when you do. Well, and just to kind of swing it back to like mystery writing, since that's what we're talking about. Um, if you take a look at uh, The Deep Lake Lurker, that particular mystery, which was written by Megan Caldwell, that mystery has this um, a, a kind of a, a kind of a big swing like gameplay thing in it, kind of like the chromatic desert, where by any latchkey who gets in the lake becomes the quote unquote next victim of the monster. And that has different gameplay uh, implications, right? And so that's something you can do in your mystery, right? You can introduce like a new condition, a new rule, something like that, that sort of really um, it puts the pressure on the latchkeys. It changes the nature of the group a little bit while that mystery is active. Um, and it's for contest purposes, it shows a lot of creativity. And I think, um, that's something, you know, you can definitely do. Um, so yeah, it's something to think about. I mean, I would definitely look at how the deep lake lurker does it just to show sort of like how you can introduce these like big sort of seemingly like game changing gameplay elements, right. In order to, um, in order to do something like super cool. Um, yeah. So <laughs> I see in the chat that <laughs> somebody's talking about deep lake lurker. Yeah. Um, but yes, I would I would definitely look at that one in terms of like seeing how you can really like kind of um, do some cool things gameplay wise and mechanics wise in your mystery to, to you know, to, to wow the judges, so to speak. Any other uh, questions for this hour? Is anybody having any particular challenges with the questions and opportunities in the presentation? Um, maybe not. Maybe at this point we're also used to CFP. It's no big deal. But I, I still have it's it's challenging part of the writing process to me, um, and it's like the biggest. Like I promise you, when the judges are looking at your entries for the playability, the playability score that's going to be the big thing they're looking at is like, does this work right? Like, does it like connect up between the presentation and the Q and O's? It may not be like dispositive, but it's something they're going to look at, right? So. Yeah, go ahead, Steph. So how, in regards to everything like being airtight and the questions and the presentation leading up to them, how direct and uh, versus how subtle should you be when making those connections? I think more, I, Amanda knows what I'm about to say, I think more direct is better, right? I think you should be like super explicit about it personally. Um, you know, you can't account for every possibility and you can't, and to some degree, you the game has a certain expectation that the players are going to play in the spirit of the game and not go investigate things that the game clearly has no interest in, right? But you should at least help them out as the mystery writer to make it feel like a plausible activity they'd be doing, right? Like, like you know, if you're doing the house in Escondido Street, I can't stop the latchkeys from investigating the possibility that the family just moved away to Tucson and didn't tell anyone, right? Like I can't stop the latchkeys from doing that, but the clues I give them better circle back to the only question they can answer, right? Like, like you know, like that's the thing. Like, so, um, so you can't totally eliminate like weird rabbit trails in the investigation, but you can definitely you can eliminate a lot of possibilities, right? You can definitely get it pretty focused in the presentation. Um, I think the more explicit, the better. Um, like, just outright, why is the house evil? Uh, how do you know she's possessed? <laughs> you know, like, like there's no, there's no question. She's possessed, right? Like, you can definitely, you should do that. You should definitely have it be very thumb on the scale. 
yeah, in my opinion. But other people might have other thoughts. I don't know. That's, that's my that's my approach. <laughs> Go ahead, Jack. Uh, yeah, so I had a quick question. Do you typically start with the question uh, and the opportunity and then get into the presentation or do you tech, do you tend to extract a question from the presentation? For me personally, it goes uh, uh, both ways. <laughs> um, sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. Uh, sometimes I sometimes the mystery comes fully the questions come fully formed in my head and I have to just get to that point. Sometimes I'm sort of figuring it out as I'm writing the presentation, right like, uh, slumber party is a great is a great example of one that I kind of figured out as I went because I, what I really wanted to do in slumber party was to just write the slumber party right that's what I wanted to do I wanted it to be a slumber party I wanted it to be a Ouija board style game I had no idea up to that point what was going to happen afterwards <laughs> I, I just knew something was getting summoned and it was going to be a slumber party and I kind of eventually got into the okay it's it's a possession okay I, and I like a possession because it makes the stakes really clear and it also increases the possibility that the uh that the mystery can go other places right that was a big concern of the slumber party i didn't want all of the mystery to be happening in samantha's bedroom right like i, I wanted it to be able to like go other places and so a possession was really great way of like doing that because we could have Linnea wander about and you know and maybe that's significant and so we should go look into where she wandered to you know that kind of thing um so that's another thing i think about too like you know don't just think about like it in, in terms of hard questions and opportunities as you're writing the presentation also think about like you know what kind of gameplay experience do i want to have how focused do i want this to be what do i want the geographical scope to be if you take a look at um we'll get more into this later when we talk about locations and stuff but if you take a look at in the between for example that first mystery uh, that we recommend the St. James Street Ghost that all takes place in one house right um, same thing with House in Escondido Street and public access it all takes place essentially in one house and its surrounds and that was an intentional choice because I really wanted that house in those mysteries to be a focus like I wanted that to be the focus and indeed they are the starting mysteries and so it's kind of nice to keep everybody kind of contained right you might have different ideas and so you know you know, scope is a good thing to think about in your presentation as well. Like, where do you see this going? And trying to look ahead and around the corner of like how playgroups are going to interact with this. Um, that will that will ultimately inform all the stuff you write for the mystery, right? Locations and characters and everything. Um, but to answer your question, no, it kind of just depends. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes I I know right away. Sometimes I don't. So. Is anybody else? I, other I know other mystery writers are on here who've published things. Anybody else have any thoughts on how they approach this part of it? Go ahead, Amanda. Willy nilly. <laughs> it depends on what I want to do. Sometimes I'm interested in one thing. And so I build like the whole present the mystery part um, because I want to present this particular mystery, like this spooky thing. I recently wrote one um, about mummers at Christmas in for the between where they are kidnapping children. And I knew all of that part. And then the questions had to come after I had like even half the clues done because I couldn't really figure out how explicit I wanted to get in my questions and opportunities. Um, but once I got most of the writing out there, you know, especially the dangers part, I had a much better idea of what sort of things the the hunters needed to do. So yeah, yeah. back and forth. I think one thing that's nice about this structure is um, it's really hard to mess it up in terms of like, oh, I have to go, I, I did the wrong thing and I have to go change everything. You really don't like, because everything is so compartmentalized and sectioned off. Like it's not that, it's not that challenging to like, just be like, okay, well, my question and opportunities suddenly don't work very well after everything else I've done. So let me go back and just figure it out, you know, like it's, it's pretty straightforward. Um, so I think it's okay to, to sort of like, just see how your own kind of style develops. It's, it's safe. It's perfectly fine to do. Any other questions or comments for this first hour? I'm gonna look at chat as well, make sure there's nothing in there. Okay, I don't see any hands or anything raised. So we're just at the end of the hour, so the timing is good. Let's take a five minute break and then we'll come back and do the second hour. Okay, so we're on the second hour, which is I'm calling uh, creatures, characters, and places. When I 
at the top of the uh, workshop when I said that one of your major goals in writing a mystery is to give the keeper stuff to play with, elements to use in the moment, uh, that's that's this part of the mystery, okay? It's all the, it's the supernatural dangers, it's the creatures, it's the central threat, it's the characters, it's the places. And, and it's really kind of, um, like, I think the best way to think about it is what public access and indeed my other games asks the keeper to do is almost like a, it's like a structured improv, right? Like you're improvising setting details and reactions in the moment probably a, a little bit more than you would for a traditional role-playing game but it's not pure improv like say fiasco or something like that right like it is it it has some things there for you it has some structure it has some things you can play with and that's that's sort of the balance we're striking here and this part of the workshop what we're going to talk about right now is the biggest part of that um so we're going to start with the threat and associated dangers. So the threat is um, maybe not the right word necessarily, but it's the best word I can come up with in this moment. Um, it's the central danger or problem in the mystery, right? It's the house in the house in Escondido Street. It's the entity that possessed Linnea Rodenbecker in Slumber Party. It's whatever the heck the creature is in the lake in Deep Lake Lurker, right? That, that's your sort of central threat. And when you're writing the little portion of the mystery that kind of explains what the threat is and what it does, the, this is kind of connected to what we talked about earlier. You want to make sure that whatever you write there accounts for whatever possibilities have been imagined in the questions, right? This is especially important if you have a threshold question, like is it a ghost or is it a demon? Because your text has to sort of account for that a little bit, right? So if you look at Slumber Party, it says, if it turns out it's a ghost, uh, it does this. If it turns out it's a demon, it does this, right? You want to be, you want to kind of like give the keeper all the information there they need. A sort of inverse problem that you want to avoid is, uh, and I run into this a lot in the ones that I have to edit for publication, is you want to avoid your true idea of what the threat is being represented in the description when you have entertained other possibilities, right? So uh, here's what I mean by that. Sometimes I'll get one back for editorial where like the threat, they, the description of the threat is super cool, but it's clearly like one option right like the, the 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 writer had one thing in mind despite the fact that there's a possibility it's another thing and so just make sure that whatever possibilities have been entertained in the presentation and the q and o's you reflect this in your threat text like it has to account for that a little bit right sometimes this is not such a big deal like in escondido street there are the only possibility is the house is malevolent and it has telekinetic powers right and so there's only one thing to write to right um, or to sort of point toward, but so just have to keep in mind, I kind of keep in mind, like, you know, am I giving the keeper everything they need for all the possibilities that are imagined here? Um, some things you can focus on, you know, the physical description of the central threat. Uh, I like a three details approach, like three descriptive details. Um, if it's a threat that has a personality, um, you know, it's mannerisms, noting that is important and a quote, if it's something that might speak is good. Uh, powers and abilities, very, very important for supernatural central threats, right? Like what can it do? How can it harm the, the latchkeys? And um, the way it might react to certain latchkeys. So if, you know, your latchkey has a certain condition, if your latchkey is stuck in the chromatic desert, if the latchkey, you know, um, is sort of injured in some way or just, or just, you know, how might it react to specific latchkeys? You might note those things as well. All of this is just to say that you are trying to give the keeper as much stuff to improvise with and play with in the moment while still kind of keeping within a fairly brief, quickly readable piece of text. It's not the easiest thing to do in the world, but um, but I think as long as you're kind of keeping in mind the bigger picture of, I just need to get down a little bit of information for the keeper to play with, I think you're in good shape there. You don't want to go too overboard in the detail unless you think that's very important to understanding how the threat works and that might be you it might be important for the keeper to get into the headspace of the threat and so you give a little bit more detail about it right and that's okay 
Something you also want to try to avoid in your description of the threat is you want to avoid accidentally answering one of the questions. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to keep that in mind too. It's really easy to do. So just make sure you haven't done it, right? Um, try not to like accidentally answer the question in the way that the, the central threat behaves. Um, the next part that you have to kind of write here is the, it usually is framed as if the thing is ignored and then what happens. This is really, really important part of the mystery sheet because one of the things the keeper always has to do is the keeper has to think about how might the world change if this threat is allowed to run rampant in Deep Lake? How might the world change? How might it become like more dangerous, who might be harmed, what sorts of things might happen, because this is what the keeper needs in terms of like thinking about, okay, um, they've been ignoring this threat. So what's been going on, you know, they've, they've been focused on Zagreus when they should have been focused on Deep Lake Lurker. And what, so what the, what is the Deep Lake Lurker doing now that they've been ignoring it? Um, this is where you put that information. If it, other games, um, like Blades in the Dark, for example, has like this really structured like clock system whereby it's like, okay, here's a clock for this, here's a clock for that. And we move the little clock segments and whenever the thing happens, then it happens. And that's a great approach because of the way that game is structured. But in this game, it's a little bit looser, right? It's more just like, here's some ideas, Keeper, like, you know, but we're still acknowledging it. We still have to acknowledge, you know, that things are not just like statically stopped because the latchkeys aren't paying attention to it, right? Things are still happening in the world. And this is where you can kind of like address that. You can also address this in a really like hard procedural way too. So sometimes it's good to do something like a clock and say, if the latchkeys have not resolved this mystery in three night phases, then something really bad happens, right? You can do that too. That's a great way of um, getting big creativity and playability points uh, on, on the judging is to have like a little like, you know, a little timer built in. You can totally do that. And the way it normally looks if we were publishing it is we would put like little check boxes to show the progression of it or whatever. It's, it's similar to like a clock idea in Blades, but um, that's something else you can do as well. I, in general, I prefer the looser approach just to give the keeper some flexibility. But if there's something that is like definitely on a timer, you can put that in there in the if if it gets ignored part. Um, you know, I think that the the sort of connected piece of the puzzle here is dangers, right? Dangers, uh, which is always capitalized in the text because it's a specific uh, sort of gameplay thing. Dangers are they are associated characters and ideas that are otherwise, that are, that are also dangerous. They can be other people, they can be creatures and entities besides the central threat, or they can be supernatural attacks that the central threat has access to, right? Um, there are no real like hard and fast rules here in terms of like what kinds of things there should be. Just think about it. Like just think about your mystery and what sorts of dangers the latchkeys might encounter while investigating this mystery. And also think expansively about what does danger even mean, right? So if you look at the house in Escondido Street, one of the so-called dangers is, uh, is Patience Head, right? The HOA lady. And she poses no physical danger. <laughs> she probably doesn't even pose a, like, she's probably, at, at worst, she's just going to be annoying, right? But she's listed in dangers because she can make the Latchkey's lives like a pain in the ass if she wants to. She is something that can, um, you know, she, I put her there because I want the keeper to think about her in those terms. Like, I'm, I need to react in some way. Let me look at the dangers and see what might happen here. Oh, okay, here we go. I also like her there because that mix of dangers in that mystery shows like a nice range of like mundane dangers and supernatural dangers, right? So it kind of gives the, the keeper some options. But most importantly, you know, when you're writing these, be thinking about how what you write might inspire the keeper to make up something on their own, right? Like how what you write down is just an inspiration, a jumping off point for what the keeper might ultimately do. That's another good way of looking at it too. So if you look at the house in Escondido Street, I chose those dangers and I chose and wrote dangers in a really particular way there because I wanted to kind of show different possibilities and like different like avenues of, of danger, or what danger means in this, in this context. Um, 
so yeah that's another thing too like it, it's not like the it's not like the, the the end all be all like it's just a sort of jumping off point for the keeper another way to look at it another way of looking at it um another note just a sort of like uh structural note when you're writing dangers if they are a person with a personality uh or they is somebody that the latchkeys can communicate with you should write them in, like you would write a side character there's just a side character promoted to danger basically i'll also note here that in the game um dangers and side characters are separate things uh this is not so important for writing mysteries but it's just maybe helpful to understand mechanically they have different functions so in the game if something refers to side characters it only means side characters it does not mean dangers even dangers that are written like side characters it specifically means side characters if 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 the game refers to just lowercase c characters it can be anything but when it says side characters or dangers it means just side characters or dangers so that's just a little mechanical game design note um so threats and dangers you know this is uh, it's super important. It's it's how you really. I mean, it's 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 what you know. It's the sort of, it's kind of what role playing games are all about. Obstacles, <laughs> right? So give some thought. Moving on to locations. So I think the locations. The most important thing for locations to think about in the beginning, at least, is what is the geographical scope of your mystery. Locations can be all the places, like just the rooms in a single building, like in the house in Escondido Street, right? locations can be all the places but on a single site like in the deep lake lurker everything is like in and around the campsite right locations can be specific businesses and residences in and around the town of deep lake that's sort of widening the circle a little bit so in slumber party summoning circle it's specific places specific businesses same thing with uh greetings travelers and you can have a mix as well so starlight kingdom um some of the locations like three or four of them are like specifically in the amusement park but then there's a few that are like kind of leading up to the amusement park like the road leading up to it and this is really one of those places where you again you have to really think about like what you expect the players to be doing and what you hope that they do right like try, kind of think about it in like ideal terms like in starlight kingdom i won't speak for gabriel but i can imagine that it was the, the conversation was probably something like i'm writing a mystery about weirdos in the desert and there's also a theme park so i have to have some weirdos desert moments and then we have to get to the theme park right and so that's why you have that kind of two-part you know sort of structure of the locations for house in escondido street i wanted the action to be really focused on the house and so that's why it's all stuff in the house now i will add as a little caveat here um ever since i wrote it uh and as i've run it um, something that happens invariably is the players want to go do archival research at the library and the library is not included in the list of locations and if I had to go write it again I would absolutely include the library because I've discovered that's something the players want to go do um, but that's something that you know is easy enough to for the keeper to improvise in the moment but if you think about it you know maybe something in your presentation implies a certain avenue of investigation right so maybe think about that and maybe account for it in the locations right so if i were to go back into escondido street i might you know i've, I've thought about it a lot like why do they always want to go to the library like is there something about the presentation that makes that be the case and the only thing i can come up with is it talks about like the maybe like the idea of the family disappearing was something that was a story at the time in the paper and so thinking about it in those terms it makes sense that the players want to go look in the library i had not intuited that at the time but um but is, that's something you might think about though like does your presentation imply certain avenues of investigation if so you should probably account for those avenues of investigation in your uh in your locations i've done this more successfully in some of my between mysteries or between threats where you know you have a body and the hunters always want to go look at the body so you have to kind of like have the place where they go look at the body right like and then all the other you know sort of you know scene of the crime places or whatever so just you know think about the scope think about the places that the characters might go and account for those i think about five to seven locations is a good number just for variety's sake and again going back to our, our central goal of giving the keeper options for improvising i think it's a good number of things um for each location, you want to have uh, three descriptive details, and then you want to do a paint the scene question, more on which later, and then 
you might have a TV and VCR. So let's talk about the TV and VCR because this is a public access specific thing. In all of the published mysteries, each, each mystery has one location with a VCR and a TV combo in it, right? So in Escondido Street, it's the unplugged TV and VCR that works despite the fact it's there's no power. Um, it is the the line monitors in Starlight Kingdom, right? When you're waiting in line to get on the ride. Um, this is a thing that kind of feeds into obviously the themes of the game, which is like television and VHS tapes and the Odyssey tapes and all that. It's a chance as a scenario writer to really stretch your legs in terms of creativity, okay? Uh, and playability as well. Like if you want to show your sort of rules chops or whatever, rules writing chops. You know, if you're thinking about doing this, you don't have to, it's not required, but if you want to put in a TV and VCR, think about how watching an Odyssey tape in this location can increase the creepiness factor, okay? Like how can we make an already creepy process even creepier by, by watching it here instead of back at Rodenbecker Street? How can you introduce new rules, new conditions, new gameplay elements? Like what is something fun that happens in the rules because they're watching the tape here? And this is the more subtle thing, but it's something to really think about is how can watching the tape here connect to the broader story, right? So I'll give you some examples of, of each idea here. You know, the creepiness factor, I think when we talk about like upping the creepiness factor, Probably the best example of this is if you watch the uh, spoilers for Slumber Party, if you watch the tape in um, Dolores Rodenbecker's uh, little den <laughs> where she's watching, she, she's this character who's sort of like caught up in her nostalgia, her own nostalgia of her her performing days as a musical performer. And she just watches tapes of herself all, all day. It's all she does. And if you go watch one of your tapes there, you get this like, weird Dolores thing that happens if you watch the tape there and then it kind of comes back to haunt you later, right? Um, it just it just makes the whole, an already creepy situation even creepier, right? Um, we talk about things that play with the rules. Escondido Street does a great job with that because if you watch the tape there, then the players learn a new clue. They get a clue from it, right? So that's something you can do. It's a pretty easy one to do, especially if you can kind of, you know, kind of give the clue some, a certain texture. Another example of this is in Starlight Kingdom. They get another, the clue, they don't get a new clue, but their clue gets changed when they watch the tape. One of their existing clues becomes more, uh, more like alien or, you know, kind of UFO sort of inspired. And then TV VCRs that connect to the broader setting and story. This is harder to do, but boy, if you can pull it off, I think it'd be super cool. Um, in Convergence, that TV VCR that can be found in Convergence is the same TV and VCR that is in the stinger scene with the big man in the first uh, uh, the first session. It's the same TV and VCR because if you, if you look at the description, it's, it, it matches the description, right? And so that's something you can do too is like look at the broader setting and think about how you can kind of, you know, um, you know, connect your this special tape watching uh, thing to the broader setting. Uh, it's, it's a harder thing to do, but I think it's, I think it's fun if you can pull it off. Um, I do want to talk about paint the scene. So paint the scene is something that your locations have to have. And it's a question that essentially the, the posing and answering of the question helps explore an idea about that location. So it's, despite its name, it's not just set dressing. It's not just description. It is that, but it's also an idea about that place, right? Like in, in exploring what the place looks like, we're also learning something about that place. This is a technique that I developed about uh, seven years ago, and it's been in lots of different other games as well. Not just my games, it exists in a lot of places now. But when you're writing the paint the scene question, just keep that distinction in mind. The question is not just what do you see? It's what do you see and what does this tell us about this place? Or what do you see and how does it make you feel about this place? There has to be like a connected idea in the question. If you, as long as you do that, you're good to go. Um, I'm going to give you an example. It's not a public access example. It's more of a, it's, it's a paint the scene I used to ask in an old Dungeon World campaign I ran actually. But I loved it because I think it really, shows sort of the the possibility here so the characters are 
going through this sort of uh, villa grotto belonging to a Medusa, right? And the question is, looking around, how do you know this villa belongs to a Medusa, right? And I love this as a question, as a paint the scene question, because it gets the players thinking about, okay, one, we are in the villa of a Medusa. What does that mean? It gets them thinking about what Medusas are. It lets them even develop in the fiction what Medusas are and what they do and what their concerns are. And then it creates some really cool, like kind of cinematic gameplay opportunities. So the question might get answered, well, all of the mirrors are covered up, right? Or there are frescoes with a lot of snakes, <laughs> you know? This person clearly loves snakes, um, you know? Um, one I heard that was really cool was, um, there are no steps, it's just ramps because it's the kind of Medusa with a snake tail, right? And so they slide down as, as opposed to needing steps, right? The paint the scene question is a chance to really invite the players into the world creation, right? And to invite them into the setting creation. And the way you can really get it done right is to make sure there's an idea connected to it. Um, I wanna take a look at one of the, just popping over to one of the public access ones, just because I feel like we should have a public access you know, example here. Um, oh, I love this one. Okay. The master bedroom in House in Escondido Street. You get the decor, you know, the, the teal and mauve with seaside motifs, which is what my parents' room looked like in the early 90s. Um, paint the scene. What here makes you think that mom and dad were focused more on their children than themselves? I love this question because it it is an opportunity for players to really, really like put their own spin on what's happening in this house, right? Like who these people were, what their deal was. It, it tells us that mom and dad did care about the kids. So that's established, but it also kind of invites the players to like say, well, why? And it gives them a chance to really like think critically and analytically about the place and about the setting. And, and this, is the nature of my games. It's it's meant to be a collaborative process and this is one of the ways you can do it. And so really be thinking about like in your paint the scene questions, not just what does it look like, but what does it look like and what does it mean, right? That's, that's the key. This is also helpful advice for if you're writing an Odyssey tape for the contest because most Odyssey tapes have a paint the scene component, especially in their first prompt. They don't have to, but um, is, but if one of your prompts is very focused on the, on the set dressing of the Odyssey tape, a paint the scene question is great thing to include. Okay. I think that's good for locations. Now let me just save a little bit about side characters. Uh, again, you want to think about the scope of your, the geographical scope of your mystery when you're thinking about side characters. A very localized mystery should have side characters who serve very specific functions in the story, right? Um, or who are always found in certain places or circumstances. A more geographically expansive mystery kind of requires that the side characters be a little bit more general purpose or like they can be airdropped anywhere they're needed, right? Um, that's a lot more of the sort of toy box approach to the design. Um, so be thinking about that, like think about it in terms of scope. Like, you know, if, if, the, if the mystery takes place in one house, the characters should be people who are connected to that house, right? Like why else would they not be? If the mystery is the kind of thing that roams all over town, you can include some just you know, kind of general purpose characters that they might run into, street people or, you know, you know, police officers or whatever, right? When you're writing a side character, you should have their name, obviously, and then their role or their kind of purpose in the story, which is kind of listed there next to their name. Um, three descriptive details is helpful, again. And then their basic function in the mystery or how they interact with the latchkeys. This is pretty important because you just, you got to give the keeper something in terms of like, well, what's their deal? Like, why are they here? Or if not, if we don't know exactly why they're here, if they're more general purpose, then how might they react to the latchkeys asking them questions about this weird thing, right? Um, you want to put that there. I want to talk about the quotes though, because I think the quotes is where you... The quotes of the side characters in terms of winning the contest is probably your best opportunity to do it, okay? This is the creative writing, uh, the quality of writing part of it is this, okay? As someone who has written a lot of mysteries and edited a lot of mysteries, I will tell you that the thing that sets apart the 
the the okay but good ones from the really amazing ones are the quotes on the side characters because this is the most like kind of literary part of the process right giving voice to characters is something that you know that is um it just shows that you have thought a lot about them and that you know what they sound like and that you and 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 you are giving the keeper like something cool to play with right you want to make sure that This, this is my best advice here. The quote should reinforce what's written in the description, but expand upon it as well. The early games, the early mysteries that we published for Brindlewood Bay say, we were not good at this. We hadn't quite figured it out yet. The quotes, if you go back and look at the early versions of the game, the quotes were just like basically restating what was already said in the description <laughs> just just in dialogue form <laughs> you know it just didn't say anything new about the character the better version is when it basically reinforces that part but then expands on it it gives you something more it tells you more about them it tells you more about their point of view it tells you more about how they approach the world and it gets it all done in a couple of sentences <laughs> right like it's it's tricky it's tricky writing writing task but Again, this is like where you can really make your mystery stand out. And so think about it. Like, don't just like, don't just like get past the quote in a hurry. Like really, really think about like, how can I make this character come alive? What would I think would be interesting? I like to think about the characters in terms of like which actor would play them <laughs> or or which character do they remind me of on TV or a movie and then let that kind of inform how, how, I, how I play them. Um, I'll give you a couple of like, like, if you go look at okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna suggest you take a look at uh, Dolores Rodenbecker and Slumber Party. Um, I spent a lot of time on that quote, and I love that quote because it it just gives you such a good insight into her um, her mental state, but also it 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 really harkens back to a certain type of pop culture character, like a um, like a sort of you know Sunset Boulevard character or like. Uh, or like Pearl in those Ty West movies that came out last year, or like, um, you know, uh, just any character who's, or like a David Lynch type character, like any character who's sort of like caught up in the past, you know, that's what that quote does. It, we're told that in her description, but the quote really kind of brings it alive. Um, I like quotes that you, when you're writing your quotes, you really want to make sure you're avoiding all of the characters sounding like they're just you and your voice, right? Like that they're all just using the same types of words and expressions. Like you want to give them their own like little kind of voice and their own expressions. Um, you know, this is a creative writing skill, but I think it's something that you should really focus on if you want to make your, your side characters really stand out and your mystery stand out. So um, it's a thing that I always like look at when I'm like editing these, I'm like, oh man, I go straight to the quotes. I'm like, okay. Am I going to be like excited or am I going to be doing a lot of revisions here? You know, so um, for the contest, I think it's a good move. But yeah, all for this whole hour, it really is a lot of just creative writing and there's not a lot of advice I can give you. But I do think that if you just kind of, again, remember what the purpose of all this is, which is to give the keeper things to play with, I think you're, you're halfway down the road at that point. So I think that's all I've got for this hour. Um, let's go ahead and turn it over to the group. Um, any questions about any of these topics or from the first hour, if you thought of something from last time as well. Go ahead, B. Not to be the first person again, but uh, when you're writing side characters and dangers, um, Starlight Kingdom came to mind where they had like the Highway Patrol, I believe, as a danger, but they weren't specific people. How do we decide like whether they're going to be like a specific Highway Patrol yeah. person or not? It's a great question. Um, I and when I was editing that, I actually thought about making it a specific character. Um, I ended up leaving it the way it was, uh, which is how Gabriel had written it to be just a more generic highway patrol thing. And I think the reason why I left it that way is because, if I recall correctly, I like the idea that it's not. So if you think about like our goals of like providing the keeper with you know with things to play with, you're also trying to like give the keeper just general inspiration, right? And so it was good enough for me for this danger to exist as just a generic highway patrol so that the keeper is sort of pinging their brain and thinking, oh yeah, even out here in the desert, there are authority figures that the latchkeys have to deal with, right? You get the same effect by writing a specific police character right um and that would be totally fine 
A middle ground you might do is if it's the sort of character that you expect to be running into a lot, um, but you still want to just have like one generic entry is to give them names. So like, or just give a list of names. So you give like the basic description and then you say some names if you need them. That's like a good middle ground. Um, you can see this in uh, in Greetings Travelers in um, I think the one with the, the wellness resort cult. I'm pretty sure that has a similar thing of like possible people. Actually, that one's a little, that was a weird outlier because structurally it's different than the other mysteries. But, but this is something you can do. You can like have a generic like kind of grouping and then just give a list of names you know oh oh uh, the kids who go missing uh for the D, &D game and greetings travelers they there's like just a list of like here are some kid names if you need them right um that, those are side characters but it's the same concept any other questions or any thoughts about that uh dimitri go ahead yeah thank you now so maybe it is like connecting the dots but does the paint the question approach has something to do with this you know like trophy keyword do we need to keep in mind some keyword when we are working the locations what's your mm, i mean you can that? right i mean i think it can only increase the sort of like if you are using a theme for example or a big idea it can only increase the overall coherency of the of the mystery, but I don't think you have to though, right? Like in Escondido Street, a lot of the paint the scene questions are about family because family is a central idea in the mystery, but there's other ideas there too, right? Like Escondido Street also plays with uh, like very particular time frame of American pop culture, like with movies like E.T. and stuff like that. Um, it plays with lots of different ideas. And so I wouldn't like limit myself necessarily, but if you need a touchstone, if you want to focus of, of some sort, like something to give you inspiration. That's not a bad approach. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Sasha? Thank you. Hey, I'm Sasha, DM. And I was just wondering in regards to the uh, special rules and the locations where you can watch the Odyssey tapes, uh, what do you all think are some good levers you can kind of pull there, you know, that are you know unique, but don't necessarily take up all the air in the room, you know? I'd love to hear other people's ideas on this because for my own writing, <laughs> when when you when you have written or edited eight of them, you you start to run out of ideas. <laughs> uh, so personally, when uh when I I'm yeah on the mystery that I'm working on, uh, I'm probably going to revisit this a little bit, but um. Currently, I have the special rule is very much so linking uh, almost exclusively to the thematic aspects of the mystery, uh, as opposed to focusing on the creepiness factor or anything like that. Um, I have it set to effectively add a precursor to every prompt uh, that says, this Odyssey tape is now a musical. Uh, so that's effectively, uh, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be the mechanical lever. Um, like for the mechanics portion of it, uh, I just have it set so that uh, the latch keys can collectively define a clue based on the contents of the tape so long as it relates to music. Um, and since it's not like uh, a super impactful mechanically like it's it's fairly impactful mechanically getting to uh define a clue but it's not something super huge um so i also have it so that you know after the mystery is resolved if they want to go do that again they can go do that again as long as they have access to the place uh but if it was something more explosive or something like that i would consider maybe even destroying the vhs player or the VCR after the fact to really showcase like this was a really big explosive moment in the story. So the TV literally exploded or something like that. Go ahead, Jack. Uh, so I'm doing something uh, not similar, but uh, just sort of playing off what Steph was talking about with the intensity and danger of uh, special VHS. Uh, so one of the ideas that I'm playing with is that watching it in a certain room in the mystery activates another danger. 
Um, and, and I guess it's also part of a question is when you're, when you're determining dangers, uh, do you typically want to, because I want to activate the danger and I like the idea of it being uh, a reaction to something, but I don't want it to necessarily be uh, something that is, like I'm torn between tying it to this event of watching it in this room and just wanting players to be able to experience it and have it be a reaction that the keeper can use whenever. Uh, but I'm sort of torn between that right now. I would say that I would. I always. I would. I would say go with the thing that seems coolest to you, <laughs> and then let the keepers figure it out. <laughs> that would be my, my advice. Um, I want to comment on both of what you both said just now, though. Uh, for Steph's musical idea, I don't think you even need the like define a clue part of it. I think the musical part is like totally enough on that, right? Like that alone is like cool enough and fun enough that you don't even need the clue part of it. It's like, it's, it, it I don't think the clue part of it really adds anything at all because the, the, the core idea is so good. Um, and also Jack's idea is great because it kind of is something that I would, I think is worth pointing out. When you're thinking about like ways to introduce new gameplay elements or to create special rules or to just generally um, show that you understand how the game works, looking at other parts of the sheet and incorporating other parts of the sheet into what your mystery is doing is a really smart thing to do. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a related idea of like, you know, introducing conditions or introducing, you know, uh, other like character sheet elements. You can also like play with other parts of the mystery sheet as well. Um, like getting a special reward for example for doing a thing or whatever is another way or like in escondido street there's that um uh the questions and opportunities one of them is like uh not even in that part of the sheet it's with elliot uh rapapore right i think i don't know if i've been saying his name right but uh, elliot rapapore um has a his own little special question and opportunity it's just another way of like kind of doing it you have a lot of flexibility there and so you know it 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 pays a lot to just think about the whole space of your mystery right and how it all might play together um i love this question though about like the the vcr prompts if anybody else has any other ideas for that i think it's really great go ahead amanda i think too i don't really have any solid ideas uh yet but thinking about all the different places that vcrs could exist i mean it's not just in living rooms and homes you have security tapes that uh, record on vcr you've got uh i don't know the tapes at the the store you know sears or whatever that have the show all the different the same thing on the tvs um you can really work with a lot of different places and just kind of think why would a VCR exist in this place? And you'll probably be able to think of an answer. Uh, and then running with that, I think could be a lot of fun. Now I want to do something where the Odyssey tape is on all the tape, on all the TVs at Sears. That'd be amazing. That's kind of what Star Starlight Kingdom kind of does that because Starlight Kingdom has kind like, of. like the multiple TVs in the line, you know, those lines you get in, you know, when you get on rides and they're like trying to entertain you while you're sitting in line for an hour. Like, yeah, that's that kind of thing. Hi, Wes, he, they, uh, First time, first time caller, long time listener. Um, I, uh, there was something, I, I didn't do it in my mystery that I'm writing because it didn't really fit, but there was something that, that prompt of, does anybody remember the cassette tapes that specifically would hold the smaller, cause like the smaller tapes from like video cameras? And like, I, I was trying to think of how to fit it into my mystery, but it just didn't work of like having interchange, like almost an interchangeable Odyssey tape kind of thing, like really making it very kind of like, I can't think of the word right now, but like, just like, just really kind of change up things. And like, you can really like mix and, and like also like mixing and matching things. Cause the big thing that my dad used to do would like tape over and have like compilation VHS of like different TV episodes, things of that nature. Um, so it got like really weird like that, um, which, which really helped me. I kind of went a little bit more plainer with mine because I had a motel room. So I was just like, oh yeah, it's perfect TV, TV, VCR. But like, it was, I, I had like a whole list of like, where does this go? <laughs> I like the, motel, the motel room one where like the, one of the last has to put in their credit card information before it mm. watch mm -hmm. the tape. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that's the only rule guys. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm going to need a, I'm going to need a, a, you know, have a ominous charge <laughs> on your credit card bill <laughs> that you have to explain to your partner. There you go. <laughs> 
Um, go ahead, uh, Steph. So with that like interchangeable tape idea, that kind of sparked something with me. You could have it so that uh, like one thing you could do is if they watch a tape in a location, they're watching uh, like you as long as they have two Odyssey tapes unlocked, you take prompts one and three from one tape and replace them with one and three of the other tape. And so it's like this weird mashup thing. Yeah, I love that. I mean, I, I think one of the, um, I can't remember which location it is in the, in the published mysteries, but one of them does that where it like adds to, it might be Deep Lake Lurker, the one in Loon Cabin where like at the end of the tape, you see something in the lake or something. I don't remember exactly how it goes, but um, but uh, yeah, just like a simple addition to the tape can be a super cool uh, approach. Yeah, uh, Nicholas, go ahead. Um, in the mystery I am writing, uh, the central location is a gas station, uh, and uh, the place where to watch uh, this year is the. Uh, the back room with uh, the security tapes uh, and the security control uh, screen. And uh, I'm going with uh, multiple screen with uh, cameras on different parts of the gas station, the shop in the gas station. And uh, what I'm writing for the, the play, the, the, speci the special rule is uh, the video tape, the Odyssey tape we are watching. Uh, we can watch it uh, on different screen and from different angles. And uh, I'm deciding: do I do I add some rules or like uh, another player add uh, just one thing we see from another angle or just leave it like that? I'm I'm just uh, let me tell you how you do this. It. Here's here's how you're going to do this. You're going to have it be where. They watch the tape as normal, but then after every prompt, the player on their left has to say what was different on the other feed, like from the other angle. Like, so basically they react in the moment to what that person just narrated. That's how, that's how you do that. That I love that actually. I might, I'm not gonna steal it, but I, I wanna steal it, <laughs> but I like it. <laughs> I, I like it because it's, I'll tell you what I like about this idea, because it's so on genre, right? Like, man, oh man, like when you're talking about analog horror and found footage, I can't think of anything more on genre than closed circuit, multi-angle camera footage, right? Uh, I think that's how you should do it though, Nicholas, is you should have it be uh, the, you know, the, the assigned player does their prompt and then the person on their left or whoever then says what it was like from another angle, or you could go, you could go all in and have everyone do different angles, right? You know, like, you know, it, that, I think that'd be super cool, but yeah. Thanks. That's, you know, the, the rare, like direct, write this advice. <laughs> yeah, like, no, no ideas here, just go do it this way. Um, any other thoughts or questions? Uh, go ahead, Peter. Uh, Peter, he, him, I'm working on a, um... My uh, mystery is involving um, somebody who's sort of been erased from the world. They're kind of like a, a side character who's not in the chromatic desert, but is a little like that. And my one of my ongoing dangers is going to be things are just disappearing. Like once you encounter this specter, which is like static or a shimmery kind of um, Thing, little things just disappear. That pen you've got, well, it's not in your pocket. You know, your your credit card's gone. You can't remember your mom's phone number, stuff like that. And then I'm thinking of having, if you watch the Odyssey tape in the place, you will see the stuff you've lost in the tape. And there may be a chance to get it back then if you do something. So, um, I have a real specific piece of advice here too. Um, I love this idea, and I think the way I think the way you're going to make sure it absolutely gets like you get the effect that you want um, guaranteed is if a thing disappears during the presentation of the mystery. So you have something disappear right then, and that way, guaranteed, 
when they go watch the tape, they're going to see, you know, they're going to, you're going to get that effect, right? You can still have all the stuff during the mystery, like disappear. But as long as you have something that definitely happens in the beginning, you're going to get that payoff later. So yeah, it's a great idea though. Love it. It's also a fun way of framing a danger too. Like that's pretty, it's like, it's, it's, it's unique and it's very much in the setting of the game. Yeah, I think it's, it's solid. Any other thoughts on that? Or, go ahead, Nicholas. Uh, it's on uh, another subject. It's uh, about side characters. Um, I'm right. I wrote uh, a side character who is um, not available at the start of the mystery uh, because it's just a, a voice on the CB a trucker driver, uh, and uh, is that not too much to ask? Uh, to put a special object in a location that will give access to this character then? No, I love it. Escondido Street does that, right? I mean, you, you can't get Elliot Rappaport until you specifically open the closet in his bedroom, yeah. right? So yeah, mm -hmm. I think it's great. And it also helps your mystery stand out. I think, I think anytime you can kind of like embed little fun things like that in your mystery for the contest purposes, it's gonna go over really well, so. I know these judges and I know they're going to love stuff like that. So. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm just writing it because I, I find it uh, fun. And I yeah, want do it, to yeah, do it, it because fun. you love it, but also <laughs> if you want to win, it's a, not a bad thing to do. So, yeah. Go ahead, Amanda. Have the judges been announced? I just want to make sure I'm being careful oh, uh, about yeah, talking the judges, about this. Uh, the judges are Alex Rybitsky, who is my co-host on Dark and Threshold, uh, Mads Turley, who um, is a longtime collaborator and player of mine, collaborator and player of mine, and then Ollie Jeffrey, who is co-writing um, uh, the Arkham Herald game. So, yeah. Just so I know who yeah. to not talk to about Yeah, they've, they've been told to like avoid all conversations. Cool. Yeah, they're all so, good. I, I yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, Jazzy. Um, so I think this is sort of a combination of the side characters and the presentation. Um, how many sort of like first avenues of um, interaction or research do you think is like a good number to give um, enough of options without having players be like, whoa, you just named like five characters and there's a library and there's this and this and this and just feeling like there's too much going on? Three, <laughs> I know, three feels like a good number. Um, I, I think it depends a lot on the mystery jazzy as well. And it kind of depends on what you want to accomplish. In Escondido Street, there's just one, right? Like go to the house, that's it. They all go to the library, but <laughs> but, but, but I, I wish they'd go to the house, but they always want to go to the library. Um, but 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 I think maybe three as a maximum is three, three feels like the right number to me. That's not based off anything, but just having written and run this games a lot so yeah <laughs> i think beyond that it's starting it's gonna get i think anytime you I, I think the players are starting to like make notes it's like too much <laughs> you know so they should be able to just kind of remember and go any other questions or thoughts taking a look at chat real quick uh, Jazzy, is your hand still up from last time, or do you have another question? It's another question. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> um, yeah, I was like, wait, should I just follow up? But it's like a completely different <laughs> topic, ahead. like not topic, but um, I was thinking of writing a mystery that starts with an Odyssey tape. So you watch an Odyssey tape, and then uh, something in that will happen, like sort of like, you know, like the ring, like you see something, and now you have you're cursed, you're marked, whatever. Um, and I was wondering if that is something that you think might work or if you're like, that's maybe a little too much um, going outside of what has been established in the game. I think, um, I'd be curious to what other people think about it just in terms of like the content wise, does that sound fun or cool? I think from a sort of gameplay structure vantage point, which is what I'll speak to, I think that the way I would handle this if I were publishing it is I would have there be an Odyssey tape that's just available among the list of Odyssey tapes that keepers can choose from. And then on that mystery, I would have a note that says this can only be played if you do this Odyssey tape. Um, 
I like it that way just because I think that anytime you introduce something that might play with the structure, you kind of run the chance of it kind of just kind of messing things up, you know? Um, it also just depends on how you present it though. Like it could just be something that you, like if you intend for the, if you intend for the Odyssey tape to just be something that the characters watched and you want to just read it like a normal presentation prompt, it's not something they have to engage with, you could do it that way. But if it's something that they actually have to like do as a night phase Odyssey tape narration, I would have it be like, here's the Odyssey tape. And then he, for the mystery, I would say this mystery can only be played if you do this Odyssey tape. I think that's perfectly fine. Uh, that's how I would handle it. But I'm curious what other people think about just the general idea of it. Go ahead, Wes. Uh, yeah, I mean, me personally, I love the modular nature of like CFB games because um, there's a lot of like in the between there's threats that you won't even play because you don't have a certain character in the group. Um, and there's and, and I think public access with the tapes is a way that you can lean into that as well, because since the characters have moves more like Brindlewood Bay instead of having to find playbooks, um, I think that that's really interesting to me because that provides replayability, um, which is something that I'm always looking for in role playing games that I pick up. So, yeah, I mean, just a co-sign on that. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, Amanda? I also agree. I really like this idea that watching an Odyssey tape can open up new things, new plot lines for the story. It makes the Odyssey tapes have more of an influence, even more of an influence on the gameplay. And I think that's really cool. So if you watch this Odyssey, this specific Odyssey tape one evening, and then it opens up this mystery for the, the next mystery that gets, you know, announced, I think that would be really neat. I think for in terms of like submission, because there's a question of like contest submissions here as well, Jazzy, if you decide to do this, if you decide to have it be like a separate actual Odyssey tape, like structurally in the game, um, I would... You could probably you could obviously just like have that be your Odyssey tape submission for the for that track, um, but I think it's okay if you want to just like put it in the mystery too. Like if it's like really connected, I, I think that's fine. Um, I don't the judges are not going to care about that. Um, that that's just in terms of like submission <laughs> uh, submissions. That is not something that I entertain the possibility of. So, but that's the fun of this, right? We get to learn what people are interested in doing. Uh, Peter, did you have a comment or a thought? Yeah, I was gonna. I the, I was gonna say I like the idea of those extra things that happen if you have a particular condition marked or if you watched a particular tape because it reminds me a little bit of you know your your classic uh, uh, video RPG kind of thing that you know if your characters are in this town on the blood moon you will you know there'll be a guy standing under the street lamp who will give you some information that you can open a little side quest and i think that's just kind of fun and it adds to the replayability and or it's like that. or it's like legacy board games right it's got yeah. like it's got like that kind of vibe too like you know like things that unlock or change you know i think i think it's i love it i mean i, I think i wes hinted at this too with the by saying like the game's modular nature i think that's what makes these games fun to design for because they are so modular in that way um, and anything you and so you should lean into that in your writing, right? Like your submission can and should lean into that if you have a good idea. Don't do it just because, but like if you have a good idea, you should definitely pursue it. Um, I do see a question here adjacent to this in the chat. Is it appropriate to have an Odyssey tape that's tied to your mystery, or is it like the unseen's in the between where they're supposed to be kept totally separate from the actual game? You know, I'm of two minds on this. Um, so the unseen's in the between, which is what the Odyssey tapes are inspired by, those are very specifically not connected to the main story. That's kind of their purpose. Public access is different though, because the Odyssey tapes are a key part of the setting and they are central to the central mystery of what the characters are there to do. And so when the question is, is it okay for the Odyssey tapes to be tied to a specific mystery? The answer is yes, we have one like that in the game. Um, one of the Odyssey tapes is connected to Starlight Kingdom, right? And then there's the Starlight Kingdom mystery. So uh, to answer the question, uh, yes, it is officially okay to do that because we did it. Um, I think that if I was, I think just from a sort of game design and publishing standpoint, I like for them to be sort of separate even in a setting like this, mostly because the Odyssey tapes are an opportunity to explore the setting in new ways. And so anytime you can expand the possibilities of setting exploration, you should do that. But for purposes of the contest, I think it's okay for them to be connected. I think that's cool, yeah. Uh, 
uh, Steph? So back on uh, that topic of like the modular nature and the connectability of everything, um, I personally think it's always really cool when one portion of a game is effectively communicating with another portion of the game that then changes the story. So to give a more like concrete example, um, I wrote a playbook for Ghosts of El Paso called The Pawn. And in it, uh, it has a core move that if something goes bad, um, whoever or whatever you are interacting with is now working with another threat. So the way that that move is worded is that it's also set up so that the keeper can decide the threat itself is what is interacting with you. So what ended up happening the first time that I played this playbook is one of the threats started working directly with another one of the threats in a way that I haven't really seen work like happen before in any other card from Brindlewood game. You don't really tend to see the mysteries or the scenarios intertwining so uh, intimately, for lack of a better word. So that's something that I really wanted to experiment with on that. And I think things like that are really like incredible and they, they blow my mind personally every time that I see stuff like that. And especially appropriate for the setting too, right? These are, because you have to remember, I think this, this is, at the beginning of the workshop when I talked about like, think about the setting and think about who these people are and where this place is. Another thing to consider and to keep in mind is this is a small community, right? Like the people who worked at Public, who worked at TV Odyssey and who were making shows on TV Odyssey, they were locals, right? By the very nature of Public Access TV, the guy who does the weird cooking show live he might have lived two blocks down from you right? you know like so so i think it's okay for this stuff to interconnect indeed i think it enhances the setting um i think you just want to make sure this is bigger carve from brindlewood advice i guess but i think you always just want to make sure that like you do you're not tying the keeper's hands too much like you know you have to have some flexibility in there but as long as you feel comfortable that your connecting of elements is is pretty easy to keep in hand for the keeper. I think you're probably okay. And indeed for public access, I think it's a cool idea. Um, kind of playing with the modularity of things and, and moving things around and connecting things up. I think that's fun. That's actually been a really big feedback thing I've gotten from people who've read the game is they like how the mysteries in public access versus the other games have a lot okay. more like- That doesn't change. Have a lot more like unlockables, you know? And like a lot more kind of like hit Easter egg unlockable things. And so, yeah, you should definitely do that. It's, it's always fun. Uh, any other thoughts or questions? Uh, go ahead, Wes. I just want to shout out Peter, because when you brought up the the videotape RPGs, it made me think of Community with Pile of Bullets and Vince Gilligan. And now I want to see an Odyssey tape that's just like that. <laughs> that's just creepy Pile of Bullets. That's, that's it. That's, it got my brain moving. Go right it. <laughs> um, okay, we're getting close to this hour. Are there any other questions or comments? Okay, let's go ahead and take a five minute break. We'll come back and do the last hour. Okay, it's the last hour. Um, this is for moments, clues, and rewards. And then we're also gonna talk about Odyssey tapes. So moments are, um, in my opinion, moments are the most fun part of the mystery to write. This is the part that I, I do it second to last, right before I do the key. Um, this is as my treat. <laughs> like this is the little treat thing to write because they are truly, um, they're, I call them mechanical free agents. They can, they have no specific purpose in the game. And because of that, they are just pure creativity and you don't have to worry about like, Oh, does is it going to work mechanically or you know it's just pure fun and creativity so really embrace that part of it they are mechanical free agents they can be used as keeper reactions they can be used to set the mood in a new place or in the you know moving into a new location or a new phase they can be uh, clues actually i've done that i've like just adapted them into clues because it made sense to me um they are your opportunity as a writer to really flex your creative muscles though there are no rules um, i think you should be a maximalist when it comes to moments um, there's no room for subtlety here like it's wasted space to be subtle about it like make the coolest sickest shit you can and put them in moments right it's like the place to put all that stuff um 
And, but if you need inspiration, of course, go back to your central idea. You know, that's it, your central idea or your theme is always going to be the thing to return to. Moments are a great thing to do that. I like to save them for last because they are the fun part. They're like the, the extra reward part of writing the mystery, but also they're the, it's a chance to sort of fill out the mystery too. Like after you're done writing the mystery and it's like, huh, you know, I really, I didn't get to do that part where you know, this classic thing in the trope should have happened. And so where do I put that? Okay, I'm gonna go put it in moments, you know. Um, that is a way of, uh, you know, it's just there to kind of, just to kind of give you that extra little creative thing to tell the story of your mystery to, to really get into the writing um, aspect of it. And so, yeah, it's, it's a, it's it's fun and i and i think it's just something you should you should focus on it in terms of like you know just you know showing for contest purposes it's a great chance to show your creativity and to show what a writer you are so um embrace it in that sense as well uh but there's not too much advice to give here <laughs> um because <laughs> there are no rules or anything it's just a thing that you know you have to have clues are is more um mechanically significant and and precise it's obviously the a part of the central engine of the game. And so let's talk about it. So first of all, for clues, I think it's important to make a distinction between lowercase c clues and capital C clues. We're talking about capital C clues, which is a mechanical game um, uh, currency. It is, it is not the general understanding of the word clue. The difference here is best understood by <clears throat> saying that everything in the story can be a clue, right? Or more importantly, Everything that happens in the story can be context for answering questions and pursuing opportunities. It's all important, but a capital C clue is what counts for mechanical purposes. That's the difference in the game, right? Um, it's all good information. It's all good context. It's all stuff that's going to be useful when the players go to answer the question. But in terms of getting their bonus on the die roll, the capital C clue is what they get credit for. And so understand the difference of that. It doesn't have too much bearing on like how you write them, <laughs> but it's just something to know. Um, I think that writing clues is almost impossible to do badly in public access because we're in the realm of the supernatural, right? And so nothing has to make perfect sense. If you compare it to Brenda Wood Bay, in Brenda Wood Bay, the clues have to have a more mundane quality. They have to have a more sense of plausibility because they deal with like the very mundane sorts of things, you know, non-magical, you know, just, just, just murders, like family arguments, you know, romance, you know, gone bad. Like it's, it's more mundane considerations. And so you have to have a little bit more plausibility when you're writing the clues for Brenda Wood Bay. I think they're harder to write in Brenda Wood Bay. Uh, but in games like The Between and Public Access, there's, you can't mess it up because like the players are going to give it meaning right so like you don't have to worry too much about like oh does this clue make sense who cares if it makes sense like it doesn't have to make sense the players are going to make it make sense that's their job a related point when you're writing your clues you are not writing clues to build your own theory uh you you, you are doing it wrong if you do that your job as the as the clue writer is to just write a list of 20 things that might catch the latchkey's attention that's it like something that might get their attention you don't have to think about necessarily like oh this is the solution or this is you don't build your solution the temptation whether you mean to do it or not is to is to be thinking about a predetermined solution and then writing clues towards that try to avoid doing that you don't want to answer the questions in the writing of the clues having said that i do think that it's helpful to have some clues on the list that point a little bit more towards one thing or another. That's just to help the keeper out because sometimes the keeper, um, if the keeper especially has like a threshold question, say, is it a demon, is it a ghost, or is it this or is it that? Sometimes it's helpful for the keeper to have some clues that point in one direction or the other, uh, either because they, you know, maybe they want to have their thumb on the scale and point in one direction. That's fine. Um, it's, you know, maybe not the best way to do it, but they, that you can. Or they want to provide some, the way I do it is I try to do a mix. Like I try to give you clues that point to both. And so the players have to make a decision about it, you know, and actually really come up with something. Um, but as a general matter, you can't really mess this up. I mean, a clue is something that should get the latchkey's attention. 
it should not answer the question by itself. <laughs> um, some of the clues should be connected to specific questions. I think that's helpful, especially if you have multiple questions to pursue. I think you should have like three or four clues in the list that point to each to that question, you know. Um, and then some clues should be open to interpretation, which increases flexibility, or they can be more detailed, which is helpful for inspiration. I want to talk about this for a bit. So I, I tend to write clues in the more like flexible option mode. The, the clues are, they're a little bit more general feeling. Um, they maybe don't have a lot of detail. They have some detail, but not a huge amount. Um, and I like that because it's flexible and it gives the keeper options in terms of how they use it. Uh, whereas my frequent collaborator, Gabriel Robinson, um, he likes to write clues that are very detailed and descriptive and they have, you know, they, they go on at some length and they're great. They're really fun. Those don't have the same level of flexibility, but they do something different, which is very important, which is they teach the keeper the setting, right? They teach the keeper what this mystery is about. They teach the keeper what the, what this is about. Um, and so they're good in that way too. Gabriel's clues are a, a lot like moments, actually. <laughs> like they're kind of like moments in clue form, you know? Um, and that's okay. That's like totally doable. You can do a mix too. A few that are like really like interesting and dripping with detail are great. And then a few that are, you know, just a little bit more like general purpose are also fine. Um, I don't think there's any right or wrong answers here. I think this is your chance to kind of, you know, just to sort of do the kind of writing you're comfortable with doing and just keeping a few of these basic ideas in mind, you know, in terms of the mix um, of clues. But yeah, it's, 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 it's fun. It's another fun part of the process. Um, it's another thing that I save towards the end because I like, I like writing clues. Um, I do think one thing you can do to, for the contest, especially to get some creativity points and gameplay points or playability points is to consider incorporating gameplay elements into a clue. This goes back to what we talked to in the last hour about the game's modularity and operating and using different parts of the system. You can do this in your clues too, right? Um, I, like, I like to write clues that give you a certain condition or I like to write clues that you can, that give you an item to put in your corner of the house or clues that have options, right? Like sometimes you can write a clue that's like uh, such and such, pick one, and then you have like some options. And so that just gives that one clue, that, that clue becomes like five clues, right? Like, you know, in terms of like choices. Um, so you can play with the clues in that way as well. You can get really, really detailed with it if you want. I wouldn't like, I wouldn't do this more than maybe once per clue list, but you can have maybe a clue that has like a really special, like a rule attached to it, right? Like this clue can only be gotten if somebody has done this like you know only people who have marked the sandstone arch or who have marked the chromatic desert can find this clue right chromatic desert great opportunity to like play with the clue list a little bit right like clues that can only be found by people who have marked the chromatic desert um or clues that can only be found if you have a certain condition or clues that can only be found if your certain score is a certain amount you, know, you can kind of play with it in that way so um, you don't want to, you don't have too many of those. I think you want to kind of like, don't go overboard with the special clues, but it is a good way of making your mystery stand out a little bit. And so I recommend giving it a shot at least. And then, um, the last thing for mysteries is rewards. So rewards are things that the players get, um, upon completion of the mystery, upon result, resolving the mystery, they get to pick from a list of usually five, um, things. The... Half of the list is usually just the generic uh, memento from the investigation, ask another player to define what it is. And that's fun. And people enjoy doing that. It's just a fun activity to do. But then, and then the other half is like actual, like mystery specific items or characters that, you know, that, that is something we want to remember. You can write your whole rewards list to be unique things. That's another thing Gabriel does. Is all Gabriel's rewards are always like five distinct different things. He never uses the, the generic option. Um, I do like half and half. Uh, there's no right or wrong answer, but you know, again, it's another opportunity for the contest to kind of like really stretch your legs a little bit and kind of do some cool stuff. I think that it's important to keep in mind that rewards are there to memorialize the mystery. You know, they are a way to make the mystery that's resolved a sort of permanent part of your campaign's tapestry, right? If you think about it, over the course of the campaign, the group is going to probably do like six or seven mysteries. And those early ones especially are going to be dispatched within a few sessions. And we might not ever 
there's, there's, there's a chance that we never address it again if we don't have some way of remembering it. And rewards are a great chance to do that. Give them an item, give them a character, give them a, a just, just something that reminds them that this mystery happened and that this world is ongoing and that there's there's still they're still here there's still more stuff to do right and there's still or there's still you know like okay they resolve escondido street but and they don't have to worry about the evil house anymore unless they do because they didn't burn the house down but they but they still but they have elliot right and elliot rapaport can you know is is this still a thing he's still a part of the story because they chose him as a reward um Rewards can grant new moves and involve certain side characters. Those are always very popular at the table. People love those. Those will be popular in the contest for the judges, I promise you. Um, it's just another way of helping set your mystery apart uh, in terms of creativity. So be thinking about that as well. And I guess the last thing for this hour is Odyssey Tapes. So this is the other um, admission, submission track. We have talked about it actually a lot more than I thought we would. But, um, but Odyssey Tapes are, there's not a whole lot of advice I can give you here because it is mostly just creative writing. Um, obviously remember my stuff that I said earlier about paint the scene, paint the scene is very, very important. Um, I think the more important thing for Odyssey Tapes in terms of like what advice I can give is to just keep in mind what they are. Keep in mind what historically public access TV programming was. If you are from a time period when this was not a thing, or if you are from a country that didn't have public access TV, then this might be something you're not super aware of. But when I was growing up, public access TV was very low production values. That's a key element, um, like it was made with, Fifty dollars and a and a and a and a passion, um, extremely niche topics. Uh, this is the sort of thing that TV stations, commercial TV stations, were not interested in giving people shows to do. And but public access TV, nobody could stop you because you were you were entitled as a taxpayer to get space on the on the air, and so they had to make room for you um, to talk about your weird hobby or whatever, right? Or your weird like thing you want to rant about or whatever. Um, they took place in a pre-internet era. This is really important. Um, if you think, of, I, I think what makes the Odyssey tapes interesting and the idea of public access TV interesting is it was at a time when we didn't have the internet to answer all of our questions, right? And so because we didn't have the internet to answer all of our questions, we kind of had to just get information wherever we could get it from. But also there was no one to like fact check whatever random weird shit I was gonna say or do. And so like, so that's what public access TV is, right? It's some weirdo getting on TV for 30 minutes every Friday night at 8.15 so that they can talk about their conspiracy theories or whatever, right? Like, like it's that, right? Um, and so, be thinking about that like in terms of like what kinds of content might been have been on public access tv and they usually featured um stars who were not stars <laughs> uh, they they did not have star quality uh they were not the kind of people who would be hired for such a thing um and that's another thing to keep uh, keep in mind as well i also think it's important to keep in mind the game's creepypasta influences here and there are some specific creepypastas which have um either lost episodes of tv shows or public access tv as their central thing um i love kendall cove in 1999 um but also pen pal which is a terrific book which is originally a series of reddit posts but now it's a book and it's a great book um has a lot of these ideas um there's squidward suicide which is a really famous one and dead bart another really famous creepypasta about lost episodes of tv shoot series um this is all good inspiration for your odyssey tapes they don't have to and the odyssey tapes don't have to be like all scary and weird they, they I, I mean i think they should be weird but they don't have to be scary necessarily right they can just be kind of strange and that's okay too um so i think that is all of my remarks for this hour and indeed for the whole workshop so we will wrap up this hour with uh questions or comments about this stuff in this hour or just anything in the workshop if you have any other follow-ups or any other kinds of things you want to talk about let's do it now go ahead peter I'm finding that uh, I like the Odyssey tapes where they're not like overly creepy by themselves because the players are going to work a lot harder to creep themselves out. And then you're like, 
You did it to yourself, man. I had nothing to do with that. That's a great point. Um, you don't need to do much, right? Just a little nudge is is enough to get the players where they where, where they're where they're going to give you that really good creepy stuff. Um, we did in in signals from the other side. We did um, we did the the blam one, and that one has a couple of like little creepy nudges in it. But man, the group took it to a place I did not think they were going to take it. <laughs> and so and it freaked everybody out. It was great. Yeah, you're right. It's it's a good point. It doesn't have to be like so over the top. Um, the players will will get there for sure. Rob? Does it make sense to incorporate a character into your mystery who may have in the past like had a slot, a segment on TV Odyssey? Uh, you cannot. Um, it's a great question. Right. Uh, it's a great question. In the setting of the game, no one remembers or they actively will not talk about public access. Now, if it's a central feature of the mystery, I would say go for it. But just remember the broader setting and lore details of public access which is this is generally yeah, speaking problem. not a thing yeah good question though um steph so circling back to clues for a moment uh this is more of like a a comment than a question or anything but when i am writing clues i often uh will as well do them sort of similarly to moments um I like having clues that incorporate parts of the latch keys themselves, as well as like the mystery, uh, like the other side characters and things like that. Uh, so as an example, one of the clues that I have on uh, the mystery for the contest that I'm writing is a poster of a side character performing on a stage subtitled, see the doctor live this summer, uh, stuff like that. Or like you hear, you, a family member over the radio say, saying an ad for some weird thing, things like that. Uh, I like having those as, I, I especially love having them in there because it really helps solidify the themes of what like mystery or tone that I'm going for. Um, all of those tie-ins help just really solidify it. Yeah, and you're and again, you're teaching the keeper the setting, right? Like you're teaching them what your mystery's setting is is about, and I think it's really helpful. Uh, Wes, uh, yeah, uh, circling back to moments, uh, which I love moments. Uh, I love them so much that I have a long list of moments. What is, what's like a good number to aim for? Because that's like one of those things where I'm like, I, I could do this all day. I can, <laughs> yeah, I, can like, yeah. Um, I, I, I don't want to overlook. The minimum is six. Um, and okay. most of the mysteries have six. Um, Convergence mm -hmm. is the only one of the official, the official mysteries that is structurally different than the others and has more. Mm -hmm. um, but if you look at the other seven mysteries, six is the is the number. Indeed, every other game we publish that has mysteries, it's six. Uh, I say go six, but there's no there's no rule against writing more as long as you're within word count, right? But, yeah, I will murder my darlings yeah. then to keep them down. <laughs> uh, Sasha. Sort of leading off from Rob's question, when it comes to kind of engaging with, you know, the lore and mystery of the Deep Lake, how much of that is for us to expand upon, or is that just removing agency from play groups to make up their own answers? You know what I mean? It's a really good question. I think for the contest, go for it. Uh, for the contest, like, go for it. Just, do, you know, if you think it would, if you think um, it would be cool to do, you should do it. Uh, if it was something that you were going to publish or something that we were going to publish, we would obviously, like, exert a little bit more editorial you know, like discretion on that. But for the contest, I think you should, you should, you should definitely play with it. It's, it, there's no, um, of the three judges, one of them is very, very close to the creation of the game. And so that is maybe, that's Alex. He might be a little bit more like precious about the setting materials and the, the other two judges aren't going to care. They're going to love it. So, yeah. Uh, Amanda. Uh, going back to moments, I tend to have a hard time with with writing moments because of, like Wes said, just so many ideas, so many things to, to want to do. I also find like I don't want to be repeating what's already been said in the present the mystery or in the clues, adding something new. Um, 
one set of moments that I was all really, really impressed with uh, is one a section that, that you wrote, Jason, um, on the bird show mystery that I wrote for Brindlewood Bay. And because when I wrote that, moments weren't a thing in Brindlewood yeah. Bay, and you went back and added it in before it was published. And they were all descriptions of people around the bird show doing bird things, like acting like yeah, birds they're acting in their like daily birds. life. Yeah. <laughs> which nails the theme. It also really... Um, helped solve one of the problems I was having with that mystery of making it feel like there's lots of people around without having to add more side characters. Um, and I thought that was that was a really clever way of using moments to fill out the world a bit more, I think. Um, so I guess, yeah, I, I don't really have a specific question. Just do you have any general thoughts on that? <laughs> Uh, I, well, I mean, obviously I wrote those bird ones and so, but, and so I, I definitely like was, um, I mean, we talked about it before I wrote them and I was like, I remember thinking like, I just want to do something like different. Like I want to introduce a different idea into the mystery. And so the moments seem like a good place to do it. Um, but I will say maybe a related idea is my strategy for moments when I'm writing my six moments is I tend to write them in the order that I think they're going to be encountered. Like, I don't know they are, but I think they might be encountered in a certain order. And so I tend to write them in that order. Like, if I think they're going to go to this part of Escondido Street, so I wrote this, like, I think they're going to go through the backyard first. So I think the backyard moment is the first one, you know, and like, I kind of like try to, I, I sort of order them in a certain way. I should have a library moment in there, but you know, that's neither here nor there. Um, and uh, like, that's another strategy is to like, think about the the, the the time sweep of the mystery and how it might go um and that's just helpful for the keeper because then they have it in the order that like they need it you know it's not always going to work out perfectly but it's that's just another strategy you might employ uh jack oh you're muted jack oops uh you yeah, know it's not a question but just more of like a maybe some a comment or advice, uh, something I've been finding really helpful when writing moments is to think of things in terms of senses, you know, the five senses. Um, uh, and so, you know, things that uh, your characters might smell or they might see or they might hear, um, that for me has just been a really helpful approach. Yeah, great advice. <laughs> I, have to, I have to say Amanda's comment. Note to self, add a, the library burned down years ago, sorry, comment to the mystery <laughs> when running Escondido Street. <laughs> There's no library, sorry. <laughs> uh, Steph, go ahead. Uh, so with moments, uh, another thing that I've been doing is I have a special condition that's pretty central to the entirety of the mystery. Um, one thing that I like doing that again ties into my my whole thing of I love tying different mechanics together and different aspects of a system to kind of work it in ways that don't typically happen is uh, so I have eight moments but the two extra ones and one of the six are all tied to specifically only if uh, a latchkey has that condition so then they only experience this moment themselves um, and things like that. Uh, and another thing that uh, I like to do in a similar vein, um, though kind of more in relation to clues, is uh, I have, I'm working on a Car from Brittlewood game called The Shattered Veil. It's, it's very like deeply steeped in supernaturalism. And one of the things that I do is in addition to the uh, 20 clues, I will have five separate clues specifically uh, supernatural clues, five additional supernatural clues, so that if someone is investigating something in a supernatural way, you have one of those that you can give them if you need to as well. Yeah, that's a great that's a great idea. I um, I really love the idea. I wanted to kind of follow up in a couple of things. Um, when we talk about like strategies for these things, this is uh, Jack's note about using the senses is great for clues as well, right? Because the the, the latchkeys might you know, they might see a thing, they might smell a thing, they might hear a thing, you know, just, you know, that's another way to kind of think about them. But I, I like that a lot. And uh, Steph's point is really good, going back to this idea of like the rules modularity, right? And like incorporating different aspects of the rules is a, just a great way of making the mystery stand out. And and people, people love it. Like, it's the kind of thing when you're reading it, like, oh, I love that. You know, so it's always fun. 
Uh, go ahead, Nicholas. Um, when reading public access, uh, I found out that uh, some Odyssey tapes have uh, special names with uh, white signal uh, noise. Uh, is this a codification of some sort or just a random uh, things? I, I, I tried to put some things, but uh, it, it is, that don't is, know if I could add No, more. yeah, that's no, a great question. Um, so what Nicholas is referring to is how some of the tape labels make ref reference to the pure white signal or just or they just say the words pure white. Um, this is a setting thing, uh, but it's not something that's like super well defined. This is just how I write, period. Um, what I mean for it to mean, what I think it means, is the pure white signal is the part of the character sheet where your character is either dead or gone, right? They are retired from the game. They have, they have touched the pure white signal. And if you look at the tapes where there is a note on the label about pure white or the pure white signal that was words pure white, it's when lots of murder has happened. So if you look at the cooking show one, it's when Carol has murdered all of her guests. If you look at uh, the one with the little girl in the basement and the puppet, it's that one is called pure white pretext. It they, they meaning to imply that like, was the little girl killed? That's how I take it anyway. Um, pure white extreme is actually a really, really like uh, pre Easter egg for a future game that we're publishing called pizza time, um, where uh, the the big bad of that game is the big bad wolf character from that tape. And he's like a he's like a Lovecraftian horror. And so this the label of the tape is a is a few is a reference to the future basically like mr big bad is like mr big bad truly right so that's 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 all it is um it's just a it's just a writing thing it's just a little fun easter egg thing for me basically you know it, it also kind of gives the tapes like almost like an scp foundation kind of quality you know so yeah but that's something you can do the, the label and 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 the way you're meant to read those titles is the way it, it's 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 like it's like the it's like just the handwritten thing that someone wrote on the tape that's it like it has no other it's just how they were noting it in their collection or whatever so yeah that's a good question though it's fun any other questions or comments uh, go ahead steph um, so one thing that I've noticed a lot in the Odyssey, Odyssey tape specifically is um, a lot of people, uh, myself included, when I was uh, working on mine, it's a bit of a struggle to figure out the pacing of an Odyssey tape. Uh, could you talk a little bit on that? Yeah, it's a good question. Um... When I was writing, I wrote about uh, probably, uh, I wrote about a fourth of the ones that we published and I, and I edited all of them, but I wrote about a fourth of them. And when I was writing and editing them, I was thinking, I was thinking a lot about like, what would be the maximum amount of stuff that would happen in a 30 minute block of time? like this 30 minute block of reserved public access TV time, how much could you do in that 30 minutes, right? And so I kind of start there. And then I think about, it's not so much a pacing question as much as it is like an escalation question. We start kind of low key, maybe it's an environmental description, maybe it's just setting up the show, maybe it's just something introductory. But as each prompt goes, it becomes more whatever heightened emotion I'm trying to evoke with this Odyssey tape or I hope is evoked that it just gets pushed more and more that direction. It becomes bigger. Um, and so like uh, the puppet one, Happy Jack is a great example because it's like, okay, we start with just sort of basic set dressing, dingy basement. Okay, got it weird puppet got it but little girl clearly in distress that's that's the the like ooh thing and then with each one 
the sort of mania and scariness gets higher and higher. And then we get to the very end and it's like, we're, we're not even in the realm of the TV show anymore. We're just in the realm of like just pure horror, right? And so I think it's probably more of like an escalation question in that sense. But I do think, so yeah, as you kind of think about like, how much can you do in 30 minutes of TV time? How can we escalate this? You know, um, some Odyssey tapes are a little different. Like Video Beat is a little different because it is four distinct music videos but even that has the escalation right like it kind of starts like a little more innocuous and then it kind of builds up to uh the one that's not even music or a video <laughs> it's just like some you know weird shit going on um i don't know if that answers the question but that's my thoughts on it i don't think there's a science here it's just kind of a you kind of figure it out thing if yeah, anyone else has thoughts i'd love to hear them yeah yeah that's effectively what i was oh. thinking with mine um as well is like when i look at it i i'm trying to think so what is the like baseline creepiness level and then what is the that like maximum what is that last prompt going to be that really like hits it home super important right because you don't want to end on a down note <laughs> you know you don't you don't want the last prompt to be like something just completely mundane right like that would be that'd be way off base you want it to like end on a big operatic high note you know big Scary now. Any other thoughts or questions? I do want to uh, point out a comment that Sasha put in the chat, which is uh, Sasha says a favorite moment that um, he puts in nearly every mystery is a side character goes missing. They were last seen with or in X. Uh, it's flexible and puts pressure on the PCs to get a move on. I agree. Uh, it's a great reaction, right? I did note that moments can be reactions, and that's a great example of a reaction moment. Um, it um, the, the moments like that are helpful because they are another way of kind of like the dangers and threats. They're kind of a way of like teaching the keeper how to play this, how to run it, like how to run it, how to react, how to how to make it go, how to create obstacles. So, yeah, I like that. Another good one. Any other other questions or anything? Looking at chat. I'm looking at video. Go ahead, Peter. So what do you think about um, just throwing together some notes on places in Deep Lake that people might go? You know, like the public library has become like a central thing for my players. So now I have this stern older librarian who has a real hate on for one of the characters. And similarly, like the town hall, Here's a clerk, just so you have the names handy, should they? Yeah, um, I, I, I love it. I think you should put it in there, especially if you think it's something that the players might go do. Um, if you anticipate it's something the players would go do, if they play your mystery, you should, you should certainly put it in there. Um, I will tell you that like in whatever future version of public access exists, like after I decide to sell it to people for the second or third time on Kickstarter or whatever, uh, that version will have probably like a section that's like you know the town and like places in the town and all you know all that kind of thing uh but until then yeah you should definitely include those things i think it's great and if you if you think that like the, if you think it's if you legitimately think it's something that the players would go do based off what you've kind of given them in the presentation yeah you should go for it yeah, i think it's great absolutely even if it doesn't like seem super obviously connected to the theme or whatever <laughs> so deep link's gonna have 10 libraries because of this yeah probably <laughs> my librarian is really great in signals from the other side by the way so if you want a librarian idea go go watch that uh sasha to me when it comes to down to players going someplace you didn't expect that's where the kind of flexibility of the clues really comes in handy to me because it doesn't matter where they go it doesn't matter who they talk to they will find a clue it will relate to the ultimate mystery and like jason was uh, saying earlier it can circle back to where you want them to go yeah, absolutely. And also, um, I will just like repurpose a side character, right? Like, like you, like, just because the side character is not like, you know, I could just make patients head the librarian, right? There's nothing stopping me from doing that, you know, like, that's like, perfectly fine. And in terms of writing your mystery, I don't know how if that's necessarily like a helpful advice, but um, that's something you can do as the keeper, certainly. Yeah. Any other questions, or comments? Go ahead, Amanda. 
when my players do something I don't expect. Um, I will, if they want to go to a certain place, and usually there's it's a place that's referenced in some other mystery, or there's something similar in another mystery, or even in, in one of the other Carp and Brindlewood games. So just throw out a paint the scene and go open the other document and steal all of that information. I do that a lot. Yeah, there's, uh, I think that, well, and I think what all this speaks to is just like, you know, you can't go wrong by writing for flexibility, right? Um, it's it's a balance though. It's definitely a balance. Like I love writing for flexibility, but I also like it when, I also like to see mysteries that are written for like that good, that good inspirational detail too, like, like Gabriel does. Like it, it, because, you know, when we think about like the mystery as a tool for keepers, it is a document that is there to help your improvisation. And there's two parts of that, right? There's like the detailed part that inspires them, but there's the flexible part that allows them to use things as needed. And um, you'll have to find that balance in your own writing. And if you, and it just could come down to your own personal style as well. But, um, but I think it's fun. I think it's a fun part of the process. And I think it's, I think it's what makes writing these mysteries kind of like a fun thing to do because you get to kind of like, you know, you get to kind of really like play with the boundaries a little bit and kind of try things out and not get too worried about like whether it all kind of fits perfectly, right? Because the, yeah. the players it's are going to better if you out. do that anyway, if you keep it yeah. flexible, because then if somebody does yeah. something like introduce John Malkovich to the mystery, it's not going <laughs> to blow up in your face. <laughs> I'm just, should, just theoretically. I should get GMing of the Year award for that John Malkovich. <laughs> that was so funny. Um, <laughs> fabulous. Any other... um comments or questions this has been a lot of fun so far i'm really happy i agree peter that sheriff hanscom is too good to leave in just one mystery that is true <laughs> all right well i think if there's nothing else then um i'm super happy that you all turned up for this workshop and we got to go through it if anybody wants me to look at their presenting the mystery and questions and opportunities portion, I'm happy to do that. Uh, just DM me. Um, I'm not one of the judges, so I can absolutely give you feedback on it. And um, and that's the, I, I won't I won't review your whole mystery, but I'll be happy to look at that part of it. If you want to send me that part of it, I can I can be like, yes, this works, or no, it doesn't work, <laughs> and then tell you what to what to change. So um, it is my it is my my one lock. Uh, uh, or my one, um, uh, absolutely like infallible contribution to the process that I can, I can give you. So, yeah, cause I've had a lot of practice at it and I invented it. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, awesome. All right. Well then thank you all so much. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. Goodbye everyone.